afternoon, everyone. It's Saturday, which means it's time for yet another salty Saturday morning. I am your host, Mr. Kadish. Get it right. I only answer to that title. We got a lot of stuff to talk about today, including a lot of uh, uh, idio idiocracy going over on at uh, Disney. Uh, we got uh, Fantastic Four uh, casting news. We got Matrix 5 being announced. We've got Dune 3 being announced. We've got uh, Alex Kurtzman saying, oh, if only I had the power to greenlight Star Trek Legacy, I would do it in a second. And of course, YouTube is trying to destroy Shadowversity. Uh, but uh, until then, I'd like to introduce my fantastic panel of nerds, starting with Matt Vader74. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, hey, here we are. Um, I'm having trouble uh, finding tickets to uh, Romeo and Fugliette. So um, <laughs> I, 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 I think they're sold out already, dude. But <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I could have sworn she had a mustache. Like, yeah. when they put out her, uh, the... wait, that was a woman? That was yeah, that was a woman. You guys are so racist. <laughs> I'm not even Tom sure. Showed up. I don't when even did know Tom what... get here? Yeah. Oh, hey, what's up, Tom? <laughs> I just Tom showed up to call you all racist. No, we yeah. are. I'm a, I'm a Vader, Vader is going to fly bit. all the way to London to watch that play. I, I do. I want to watch yeah. Tom Holland's face. When yes. he has to smack that face, when he has to kiss her, because he's going to be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know. That's a So here's where you guys are. <laughs> this is where you guys are misinterpreting everything. She's mm -hmm. playing Romeo. He's playing. <laughs> oh. Okay, that's it. Gotcha. That tracks. That tracks. Tracks. He's a pre op trans uh, Juliet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Holland has no problem dating Zendaya, so it probably won't be an issue for him. Uh, speaking of which, we got our shield against all things woke and intersectional, Brian Montgomery from the Popcast. He's here. He's queer. He is here to proclaim LGBTQIA plus minus divided by sign uh, propaganda for the it's also, show. It's also Shakira's biggest number one fan. Yeah, I am. Shakira's yeah, Shakira. Fan. Shakira. Shakira, Shakira. <laughs> Your I don't know why my last right? name is in my name. I got to fix that. I, pretty, I think I was in a meeting or something. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at that. I'm like, why is that knock, on there? Knock that out. Call attention to it. <laughs> and then Matt draw attention. He's like, Brian Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> last four of his social is. I'm going to call you Mr. Burns the rest of the show. <laughs> um, yeah, man. Good to, see, good to be here. I'm good to be your shield. Always happy to be your shield. I have been missing my own live streams lately because work sucks. But I have Saturdays off for the most part. So, That's hello, it. darkness, hello. my old friend. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Yes, you want to show everyone your uh, phone background? <laughs> yeah, this is this is my this has been my phone background for the last three weeks. Poor Ben. <laughs> it's sad, Ben. <laughs> yeah, my wife is like, "Why is that your phone background?" I'm like, "It's just the state of my mind right now, babe." That's. <laughs> That would probably make her think a little bit. Yeah, so, that's, that's a red flag. Every day. That's a red flag for her. She's yeah, like, is, is that really what's on his mind? It used to that's used to be her. She used to be on my background. Now it's just Ben Affleck. <laughs> oh, I hate life. So she just thinks you're having right. an affair with Ben Affleck. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. I'm up for it, Ben. If you hear this, yeah. you already know my last name. <laughs> All right, and coming back to us fresh off of uh, Trans Day of Visibility, uh, Odin. How you doing, buddy? I hate you so much for even bringing that up. It was, <laughs> it was Easter last week, despite what Mr. Mr. Biden tries to say. Um, I'm just looking forward to the day where you know our our, our leadership in the church finally you know gain a spine and and next communicate his his candy ass because it's it's far past due at this point. I thought you were with well, the Oswald according to Biden. Family. According to Biden, he never said that. Mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. saw that Nancy Pelosi said uh, it was uh, Cesar Chavez Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. These people, dude. <sighs> poopy. I didn't say poopy. You just heard me say poopy, but I didn't say poopy. Oh, boy. <laughs> One word. <laughs> President of the United States himself, Tom Connors Jr. How are you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm not queer like Brian, but I am here. <laughs> um, so, yeah. No, as far as the uh, trans day thing, look, the only thing that the trans people in Easter have in common is that sometimes trans people, I'm sure, dress like fake humanoid rabbits. Yeah. That's about it. Other than that, yeah. So, I so mean, I thought we already had Halloween, furries. so, mm -hmm. I mean, ooh. Well, Christmas ooh. is going to be uh, International Furry Day of Visibility. So, uh, I mean, we already that. got Halloween. I thought that's the day that everybody dressed up and played well, pretend. We have, so. to, we have to co op <laughs> Religious holidays have to co-opt religious holidays. Yeah, yeah. 
Yep. Only Catholic religious holidays. Right? Yeah. Right, right. Don't touch Nobody Ramadan, gets the everyone. Joke, but, oh, but Odin, I saw him. He's over there just smirking. <laughs> Again, they're because it's because the the Catholics are the only group that you can go after, and they'd be like, "Oh, okay, yeah." yeah. No, I, I wasn't so. going after Maybe you. Maybe we'll start a petition to start a rosary no, I, rally. I mean, I like, mean that's the, the most that we'll do. Is I, I, I'm I, the only I, one that laughed at my Halloween joke. I heard. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. La I laughed at it internally. I, I thought about. I thought about that, that makes you racist and and transphobic. It's <laughs> true. It does. I thought about turning Catholic and you know switching religions, but there's too much kneeling and standing up. I can't. I can't do yeah, it. Yeah, I don't have the knees for that anymore. It's, it's too much work. Bro. Well, we we at the uh, Salty Saturday <laughs> podcast uh, celebrated Easter the way it should be, talking about OnlyFans. So <laughs> that was uh, that was our thing. Luckily, Odin, Odin missed that, so like he didn't have to. <laughs> Odin no, was, was coincidentally for... gone that day. Everyone was... noticed that. <laughs> well, well, it was he... the day. Of the, it was Holy it. Saturday. It was the day of the vigil, and I was preparing. That's spiritually cool. well well you know Thanks. easter is about the resurrection of christ only fans is about the resurrection of over o overly aged actresses careers <laughs> That's true. So. i didn't get to i didn't get to listen to your guys's discussion on that that was a that was a she's back in the news now her son so you're talking about drea de mateo her son yeah, says yep. he doesn't support uh her choice i said shocking absolutely <laughs> shocking during I mean, that story i found out denise richards has an only fans and i was oh, like yeah. She does content with her daughter. We got to cancel this stream right away. Yeah, what? Something to do. <laughs> Denise yep. Richards from yeah, the, yes, that's that disgusting. Denise Richards. But, yep. Are they, are they also holding up pictures of pasta? <laughs> no, that's the problem though. Yeah. yeah. If if they, I would have subscribed had there been one sample picture of pasta. <laughs> Give us some cannelloni or some some spaghetti. Yeah, something. something. Leave I'm Denise sorry. Richards alone. She is still the best nuclear physicist you've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> I love the Christmas Bond movie. Our, Christmas our, our country deserves this year. Our, our country deserves to fall if this is the current state of, of where we are. Seriously, I mean, it, this is what happened. I, I, Ottoman Empire, Roman. You get to the top of this mountain, you start you start worrying about this kind of stuff. This is what happens. We yeah. empires fall this way. Well, guys, speaking of the top of the mountain, we have a very special guest back on the show today. <laughs> nice transition, uh, Brett Dasovic uh, from. Uh, Dasovic, you got it Dasovic. right the other day on the show. <laughs> guys, Dasovic, is, is there something wrong with like when I'm here, you can't do it right? That's that's the worst you're, part. You're like, too intimidating for me, Brad. <laughs> he got it, it, in this thing, like most hard. of the time. I, I let it. I've never mentioned it on the show when he when he gets it wrong. But he got it right the other day when I sent a super chat. So why? So it's only when I pay you. Mm, like when yes. I pay you, you'll yeah. say it right. Oh, okay, exactly. The truth right, comes out. That's fine. <laughs> I'll pay next time. I'll send a super chat before the show to get it right. But uh, we always love it when you slum it with us, Brett. Oh, Elevate yeah. the show. Uh, I'm, I'm He's here referring to, to me when he says that. I'm uh, I'm here to give you boilerplate, uh, very, very fence sitter takes and, and laugh. It's going to be great. Yes, indeed. So mm. speaking of uh, uh, boilerplate stuff, let's get to some super chats real quick. Already. Uh, wow. We've got uh, WG who gifted five Salty Nerd podcast nice. memberships. Thank you so much, WG. That is very generous of you. And we also have Eric Winberg, who gifted one Salty Nerd podcast nice. membership. Thank you very much, Eric. Then we have Shane H. Wilder for $4.99. Sup, nerds? Agree with excommunicating Biden. Also, <laughs> did you all see this movie coming about called Night Bitch? Amy Adams thinks she's turning into a dog. What? Yeah, we talked about it last night. I thought that it's was called The Werewolf. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's on the release schedule as like a as like a searchlight or a 20th Century Fox movie from Disney. This year it comes out like around Christmas time, and <laughs> I don't know what the big uh, like. It it doesn't sound great to me, but it, like I, it felt like people were like really like this looks this sounds really awful. It's supposed to be like a a horror. It sounds like feminist horror comedy oh, where boy. she thinks she's turning into a dog. Like if you go, there's a Wikipedia for it already. And it, it doesn't sound super interesting, but, uh, you know, the name alone, I think, was shocking for people to see it on like a, a Disney sheet of movies coming out. I, yeah, I, I can see this already. I'm going to go to the theater, you know, to take my wife to our annual rewatch of Elf because she loves <laughs> that movie. And we're going to go. I'm going to go. Hey, night bitch is playing. Let's go watch that instead. Let's Why go. does this feel like a movie that was sitting on the shelf for five years? I think oh, they absolutely. said it was. Wasn't yeah, it? Was no, it? no, no. It's it's not. It went through like it, it's really? got the production schedule for it. I mean, it does sound like that, right? It sounds like yeah. something that got made like when they bought 20th Century Fox and they like they just shot a bunch. Oh, of what's this? Amy movies. Adams turning into a dog? Yeah. Fuck it, let's put it out. <laughs> Don't you also love how Hollywood continues just to not understand movie time slots and stuff? Like this is a perfect movie to put out at Halloween. Like, yeah. why are you putting it over Christmas time? 
like Ghostbusters coming out in between Dune and, and exactly. Kong too. Yeah. Made no yeah. sense whatsoever. Yes. Well, hey, hey you know? nothing says Christmas like Amy Adams. Right. right? So. Well, I mean, look, is Amy Adams even a draw anymore? I mean, hey, she Most played Lois Lane. Works for me. Twenty years ago. Has it been twenty years? Ten. Yeah, it's been Ten a while. years. Right. Yeah. Give or take a decade. It's fine. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, Shane H. Wilder for one nine nine. It sounds like furries. The movie. <laughs> does oh lord yep. exactly. so, all right guys and oh, go ahead. scotty Dub, one of our salty saturday superstars and our top contributor 99.99 great to see brett d back on the panel remember brett once you secure mr caters a spot on pop culture crisis <laughs> you get a five hundo crisis party with which you can purchase a life-size megan doll Ooh. to rival the whatever podcasts own tiki you know Mary wants this. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to do that for Mary. But the nobody wants the Megan doll. We talked about this last week. Did you guys? Maybe somebody here's got a different. I take saw on it. This. Does, does uh, do you have a different? Mary saw this, and 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 Phil saw this, and he just thought it sounded creepy. They just thought it sounded creepy. I said, "There's horror movie fans out there who will absolutely take this." Yeah, I'd buy it. I, don't know. I think yes. a Megan doll would look good, like right over here. Yeah. The creepy Fine. thing was it has, like, they mentioned in the ad that it's, like, it comes with underwear, and I don't know what? why you would mention that. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Because okay, now, are, yeah, are now, now it's weird. Yeah. yeah. Why, why would I have underwear? That's that weird. had to make it weird. I think someone should buy it just so they can burn it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so why would I have no underwear? Longer... It's a facsimile of a small child. Yeah. Yep. I don't. Well, well, guys, to celebrate Scotty Dub, I, I want to show Somebody you guys to our, top, something our top super chatters. So Scotty Dub is sitting at the top of the pyramid with 199 in terms of his super chat. But he has now surpassed William Forbes as our top Ooh. contributor with his $99 super chat just oh. now. So I'm going to have to redo this graphic again next week. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Scotty. Uh, but big shout out to Scotty Dub. He, is, he has always been a big supporter of the yes. uh, Saturday show. And uh, also a big shout out to Mexican Iron Man, who is our most consistent super chatter. He super chats almost every single episode we do. And we also want to give a huge, big love shout out to all of our gifters. Uh, Jillian N, who is the queen of the gifted subs on this channel, along with WG, who already gifted five Salty Nerd memberships. And uh, Sam Schwager, who gifted one today already. And we also have Major Chai Chai and Eric Winberg, who have been gifting subs on the uh, Tuesday show as well. So really appreciate you guys. And for those of you who have gotten the gifted subs, don't forget to check out our members only playlist on our channel. So all of, all of your member exclusive stuff is over there. So go check that out. And hey, Vader, guess what? Hey, what? We made our, we made our first sale of oh, our man. movie commentaries That's over awesome. on Patreon. So we got two commentaries up now. We've, we've got Masters of the Universe and Hackers from 1995. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, so it's uh, that was, it was much more of... fun than I thought it was going to be. I'm not gonna lie, that was that was pretty cool. We have a good time doing those commentaries, and uh, if you guys like to hear us shit on movies, uh, be sure to check those out because we do it in real time. And it's over on saltynerdclub.com. But uh, also uh, want to give a uh, big shout out to Pop Culture Crisis. Brett's uh, channel. So if you guys haven't subscribed to Pop Culture Crisis yet, link is in the description. Just go there. It'll take you right to the, uh, the um, YouTube page and uh, you can subscribe for, from there. They do, uh, is it three or four shows a week, Brett? Five days a five, week. Five Monday shows through Friday. Week. Yep. Monday through Friday, 3 Jeez. p.m. every single day, 3 p.m. Eastern. Come hang out. It's uh, it's in the middle of the workday. So my biggest compliment that I can always get is somebody says, I put it on and I put you on in the background while, while I'm at work. That's the biggest yeah. compliment you can get. I don't even care if you've ever actually listened to a thing I've said. You just listen to it while you're doing something else. I always well, I always catch it catch it when I'm uh, on my drive to work. It's yes, great, great it's feeling time. <laughs> yep. And you guys do great work over there. So highly encourage everyone to check it out. And also, if you want to follow any of our panelists, mm -hmm. their link is in the description as well. We, uh, real, We need to get Mary on the show. Maybe even <laughs> Mary, maybe even Mary and Brett will have a, a, a 
Something Mary doesn't slum it. She later. does not. <laughs> Mary does. Mary's like when it's the weekend. Mary doesn't want it. Wants to do literally anything but this. Like she's <laughs> like uh, I don't blame her. Right? She's like uh, she goes out and she does uh, appearances and stuff when they ask her to do stuff. But on the weekend, she's just like, Nah, nah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. And real quick, guys, we got Mexican Iron Man for ten dollars. I was looking for a Saturday morning show that had some good old fashioned nerd racism from cracker panelists. <laughs> so it looks like I found the right show. Yes, please teach Bob Iger what's woke since he don't know. That's, that's true. We're going to be talking about that in a bit. And of course, R to the icky for 199. This is for Cheap Bastard of the Stream Award. Yes. <laughs> that is definitely one of our one of our uh, awards out here. And Very I also, proud. Also, real quick before we get into it, just want to give a big shout out to Cheery Kane, Anthony Mark, Wendy Hunter, Danny's mom, Penny, Dr. Cocho Dragon, and uh, Mephisto's movie reviews, uh, Jillian N., Gavin Blackburn. Uh, guys, thank you for being here at the start of the stream. Always appreciate you guys being here in chat because we love doing this stuff for you guys. All right, so we're going to start off with a little bit of inside baseball stuff today and talk about YouTube versus Shadowversity. Now, everyone here on the panel is a YouTuber because <clears throat> Mexican Iron Man isn't on the panel today. Um, but but uh, I, I wanted to kind of like highlight this because I, I feel like uh, just be something fun to talk about. But we also want to support Shadowversity if he's yeah. going through a tough time with his channel. Uh, guys, go over there, start watching his videos. Are we all? Well, number, number one, his videos are great. They're very interesting stuff. But uh, Shad is trying to support uh, his team. He hasn't taken a salary in a long time. And he's really trying hard to uh, to keep his channel afloat. And he doesn't know why YouTube is uh, suppressing his content. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sat down and I watched, uh, you know, his entire video, all 40 minutes of it. And the thing I like about Shad is he's just so honest. He's like mm -hmm. open, like he shows you his channel statistics. He doesn't have an ego about it, you know, and stuff like that. But I, I, I thought that it was interesting that he feels that YouTube is specifically targeting him uh, and for suppression of his channel. And uh, uh, I don't agree with all of his analysis of like why his channel is slowly declining, but uh, I, I do feel for him and, and I wanted to help the guy by showcasing his, his plight today and, and getting the panel's take on it. So Brett, I, I wanna start with you. Um, I, I know that you probably didn't have time to watch Shad's video, yeah. but, but here on the panel, like we all deal with YouTube on like a daily basis. Uh -huh. So. Do you think that it's accurate to say that YouTube specifically targets certain creators and, you know, just basically shadow bans their channel? Look, uh, like to me, a lot of that is like I, I kind of take content into context there. Like a lot of times when people will say that I would make the joke sometimes when like one of our shows wasn't doing well or something like that, that we were being suppressed. But more often than not, I, I don't think that that's the case for, for something like our show, which is generally pop culture and our views have been pretty consistent in, in the way they've grown. And I think a lot of it is algorithm and figuring out, you know, how the, how to make the algorithm work for you. And to me, it's like, I, I just, I don't let myself go down that rabbit hole because it's an unsolvable problem. Like it, it maybe this is just me, but it's like, I can't make, if, if it's true and YouTube is doing this to me, I don't know how else to, you know, to pull, to get out of that box, out of that rut. So I focus on what I can do, which is to put the content out the way that I think is going to work the best. I did the best I could with my limited brain power to look at like analytics, what was growing for us, you know, as far as subscriber growth in, in the channel. And I found that doing a, that analysis helped our channel grow again. And I didn't think that it had much to do with perhaps YouTube suppression. But I mean, that's got to be very different, of course, for political channels and things that YouTube really, really wants to suppress. So to say it doesn't happen, I wouldn't say that. But to, I would say for everybody else, focus on the things that you can actually change. Otherwise, it just becomes something that becomes about excuses and not something that you can do anything about. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, Tom, you, you know, you guys have a big channel over there on Midnight's mm -hmm. Edge. And uh do you run into these frustrations where it's like you guys work really hard on producing really good content and the YouTube algorithm just doesn't give you any love? Look, I mean, we've been a part of this game probably longer than most people. And we're, we've been quote unquote suppressed forever, dude. Um, I, my channel has still not even cracked 2,500 subscribers or 25,000 subscribers. 
I've been sitting there forever. Mm-hmm. Um, I get it. I feel the pain, but you just keep moving on. I mean, uh, I feel bad for him uh, if if he feels that he is being suppressed, but I feel like we all are, right? So, uh, again, I mean, I guess bringing attention to it's good, but YouTube is just going to ignore us. They always have. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, I mean, if anything, Brett, Brett's right because – you just got to keep doing more content. Now, I will say I know that revenue is way down, way right? Down. Like, that's the thing yeah. is, like Brett was saying, like, we still have the same amount of viewers roughly and all that kind of stuff on most of the videos, but we only make a, a fraction of what we used to, right? So, I mean, I think everybody's hurting. I mean, my channel has been really hurting lately. Yeah. I've been making about half of what I'm used to and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's 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 a tough business. I It's, it's something when people ask me about getting into YouTube, I – half joking and half I'm honest when I say don't because (laughs) it's it's, yeah it's uh it's not like it used to be back when we could do even even Midnight's Edge used to get away with only doing one or two videos a week and now we can't do that obviously I mean we haven't been able to do that for more time time than we were able to so there's a lot of these big channels that are built on that right that they're built on only putting out one one video a week really but yeah yeah, um, you know, Odin, what's kind of interesting about this is like, I, I know a lot of people are, are out there and they're like, well, you know, Shadiversity, you know, Shad, he he's on like Friday Night Tights all the time, like the biggest live stream in our sphere. And, you know, you are also on that show. And they're like, how can his channel be hurting if he has that type of exposure? You know, like I think uh, FMT gets something like 20,000 concurrent viewers, you know, like when they're live and stuff like that. So as someone who's involved in in that show, what do you have to say to people who are like, you know, like, why isn't, uh, you know, he getting any benefit from being on FMT? Yeah, I mean, I think people need to also realize that even though our concurrent viewers are nowadays about closer to like 17, 18,000 every single time. And then yeah. we've gotten very close. Like our highest, I think has been around 19,000 getting very close to, to 20,000. So we've, we've seen consistent growth, um, you know, for the past, you know, several, several months, several years. And so that's been really cool to see, but we've also, at least for, at least on my end, I know I, I have not seen equivalent growth on, on my own channel. And that could be for a multitude of reasons, right? For one, my, my content is not, uh, focused on being nearly as as reactionary. Um, you know, I'm not combing the news sites for new stories to talk about. I used to do that a lot more when I had more time. But now that I've got, you know, two kids and a full time job outside of this space, and I really only do this for fun, I've kind of limited myself now to doing about two videos a week, if, if even then, like this past week, I, I didn't have time to do a, 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 a box office preview. And I think that ultimately it's, it has a lot more to do with algorithm than people think. And even though I, I would also agree that it's hard to always know for sure or to prove whether it's direct suppression by YouTube, right? Saying like, okay, you can't grow, you can't do this, you can't do that. I think that we can absolutely still blame YouTube because even if they're not suppressing you individually, they are artificially boosting other yep. channels. And yep. I think that that is the thing that really needs to be called out is, is because they're picking the winners. And by picking the winners, by proxy, you're also picking losers. Yep. Because if you are the ones who are promoting on the front page certain channels, certain clips, certain content, people who play by your specific set of rules, um, ideologically speaking, well, then guess what, right? That means that you are choosing certain types of content. And you can claim algorithm all you want, but we also know that behind the scenes, you have the ability to change things. You have the ability to, to push things uh, in one direction or, 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 the, or the other. And so that's why, again, my heart goes out to, to Shad because I, I, you know, I think that this is something where he is much more full time with this than, for instance, someone like someone like I am. Right. So I see the, the revenues going down. And for me, it's like, OK, well, I can't buy as many movies to give away this month like because that, that's all I'm using it for is is just for extra things. Um, and and it really just supports my hobby of, of being a movie fan and and loving watching movies and everything. Um, but it's a tricky animal uh, to, to say, to say the least. And mm-hmm. I think that also one thing that needs to also be held accountable to th- how they need to be held accountable is whenever they do change their algorithms, because it's always very clear when they do, because you're like, okay, this video that used to be doing really, really well, this type of content somehow no longer is doing well. And it, it almost happens overnight. And I think that them not being as upfront about that and as, uh, as transparent about that is also a big problem. 
and Shad, you know, he actually has employees that he's like paying to like, you know, work on these channels. And uh, for solo creators, it's much easier to kind of deal with like the swings and in, in revenue and stuff like that than when you actually have a staff that you have to, that you're responsible for paying. So I want to throw this to Brian hey. to kind of, kind of go off the the whole thing that Tom mentioned where, you know, YouTube has these fluctuations in um, in revenue because a lot of people's revenue is based off of ads and that's based off of how many ads are served and how many people are viewing the videos that are serving those ads, et cetera, et cetera. And even how much always, they're being paid for the ads. See, that's yeah, the other thing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it goes in cycles. Like the first quarter of the year is always a, a bad ad cycle. So revenue tends to be down in the first quarter of the year. Plus with like, uh, you know, taxes coming in, uh, this month, uh, a lot of people are kind of like gun shy about, you know, spending extra money on super chats or like they normally would or wh whatever the case. But I want to get your take on like, what do you think about the inconsistency with YouTube's revenue and how any change to their algorithm can affect the uh, creator's livelihood? Um, I think Odin's like spot on. Um, the, the, rev the revenue change, like the, the fact that these ad tiers even exist depending on the type of channel you are and that YouTube sort of shadow puts you in that box um, is sort of BS. And I think what Odin said was actually pretty spot on. They are choosing the winners. Therefore they're also choosing the losers. And when, when every video, like, I mean, I, listen, I get to the end of a video, I'll be watching a salty nerd video. And at the end of that video, you know what the next autoplay is almost every single time, John Oliver. No. <laughs> oh. No. I'm not subscribed to John Oliver. I've literally ignored every video I can. I've I've hit ignore on his channel. I'm I have no problem with John Oliver, but I cannot play a video of Talking Heads without the next video coming up, a John Oliver video, or Lex, or, you know, or Leah, or Lex. Yeah, exactly, Lex Freeman. Um, so many, like they are picking the people that you are playing next, and you can call it the algorithm or bad luck or targeting your channel whatever i have uh 127,000 subscribers on my main channel i have 7,000 subscribers on my live channel um i have like six other smaller channels that i've been building i have a couple hidden channels that only do sh shorts and i don't promote them um i've i've made channels that are all about music and i made channels that are all about this or that and i've tried to find niches and I'm telling you right now, I've had videos on these channels that get like 25,000 views, thousands and thousands of comments, and that channel will still be under a thousand subscribers. And you got to ask, what what's the difference between this content and that? Why does does my content that everyone these people like so much, it does not get promoted when? A channel just like it will get promoted above me and their content no offense is probably is subpar in comparison right you got to ask how is that happening why is youtube deciding the winners and losers and then you think about think back to that stupid questionnaire that they pushed you to to answer for every single month until you do where it asks you what your gender is what's your pronouns what your what's your race what's your background why are they asking these questions you gotta ask, why are they asking? Right, right. Why are they trying to get you trying to put you in a box? I can't I can't tell you why. I don't know. I can tell you this. A lot of smaller YouTubers or or people that have not got to 100 k think that when they get to 100 k they're gonna be able to talk to someone and get some of these an answers to some of these questions that we've all been wondering about for so long. And you get to that point and you you talk to someone who is some foreign person with access to a to a Gmail account that they hire for weekend interviews to talk to YouTubers. They're not, they don't even actually work for YouTube. They have no idea what they're talking about. And they'll take you through some PowerPoint that was pre-made by an actual YouTube employee. And that's it. And you can hear chickens in the backgrounds and stuff. It's insane. <laughs> um, it's it's literally insane that when you get to that milestone and I can't wait, I, if, if my main channel ever gets to the million milestone, that'd be great. But if it ever, if it ever does, I can't wait to see what my next rep is. And because I was so thoroughly disappointed by the lack of, of information I received when I hit that milestone. 
And I don't think that YouTube is playing fair. Uh, changing the algorithm, changing the amount of money people make based on their ads, and not telling you why, it isn't fair. And I'm not, I don't think Chad's specifically being targeted, and I feel his pain, but I'm oh, sorry, Chad. But I do think that they are targeting, uh, in a way, they are targeting him and channels like him and channels like ours because they're not giving us the same promotion. And the ad revenue that changes, like the, the, the tiers. So, like, what if your CPM is 25 bucks, right? It's amazing. But then three months later, that same video, you look at it, and the like, CPM's $4. And you're like, what happened? What? And there, but there's no communication. There's no re, there's no, this is why you're making less money on your ads. This is why you're not getting promoted. How can you have 130,000 subscribers and you put out a post that only gets four views? How is it even freaking, freaking possible? Like that, yeah, your, your own audience isn't being alerted when you put out a post or a video. Why is, why does every channel have to work through this algorithm that, that no one really understands? It's not a, it's not a fair thing. I, 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 when it comes down to it, subscribers don't matter as much as you think they do. Again, I have a channel that has less than a thousand subscribers, a th thousand subscribers, but I have videos that have 25, 30,000 views. Mm -hmm. And you're like, how is it possible? I don't understand. <laughs> and that's um, the thing no one understands. Yeah. Uh, you know, Vader, one of uh, mm. Shad, Shad's big complaints is, is that, you know, uh, he, his subscriber growth has fallen off. His videos aren't getting as many views. And before the live stream started, you and I were just kind of bullshitting about like how frustrating it is to tr try and grow a YouTube channel and put so much work into it and then see people come out of left field who don't put in any effort and they like blow yeah. up. So generally, uh, the, generally, generally, those people have a, a nice rack and are fairly attractive. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. Y you know, um, uh, it's, it's it, to me, the whole the whole streaming YouTube scene is very inconsistent as uh, I don't know. And, and, and I think a lot of it just boils down to what people want to gaze at. Honestly, it, it's, it's very frustrating. We've been, we've been doing this for four years now, you know, and, and we've, we've grown steady. It's a steady, slow growth, but then, you know, it's, it, to me, it's a little frustrating when somebody comes on and basically does the same stuff that we do only, you know, it's not some fat old bearded guy with, with a gray beard. It's, it's some hot chick with giant knockers and, you, you know, and some makeup and a week later they're at 30,000 subscriptions and we've gotten 16 over the last week. You know, it is what it is. You know, I, 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 I tell people all the time that if, if I was a hot chick, you know, the channel would be a uh, much more successful. Uh, I, I, I didn't realize, I didn't know I was, know I was, I was going down this road, but it's not but just it hot chicks it, though. There are, it, there are it, other it, factors too, where it's like this, that you can have the, the we no, have a channel and, that and popped I, I up. Know. I know yeah. it's just, it's just, but you know, it's, it's really strange to me when you you switch over to Twitch or, or any of the gaming streamers and you just see some idiot with a, a giant couple cantaloupes on her chest and, and she's got 1700 live viewers and they're just throwing the, the, the dollars at her. It's, it's very frustrating. It's very name weird. It. You have to name we like you have a pro every, gamer every, who's at the every, top of yeah. his field and he, get, he has 14 viewers. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. It's exactly right. It's, it's very strange. It's, it's frustrating sometimes. And to, to me, you know, I just love doing this. Um, if I didn't love doing this, if I didn't love hanging out with Matt and Alex and, and Jude every week and hanging out with you guys every week, um, it, 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 I wouldn't do it because, because quite frankly, um, I have other things I can do with my time and, um, but, but I choose to do this because it's fun and I, and I enjoy the camaraderie and it keeps me sane. It's an outlet. Um, would I love to do it full time? Absolutely. I would love to do nothing but, you know, play video games for, in front of people and, and talk about movies and television. Um, and I hope that we get to that point someday because, because I really hate having a, 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 a real world job that I, that I don't really enjoy most of the time. But um, it is what it is. And um, I, I, I don't know what else to say about this kind of stuff. You know, I know I'm, I'm a talking guy. I'm, I'm a commenter. You know, Matt is the dude that sits in the office and scratches his head and pulls his hair out and tries to come up with Poor all the Matt. different strategies and, 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 and comes up with strategy ideas that are 100 pages thick, you know, cool. with our strategy guides every, every once a year. You know, this, this is the thing. This is the thing. This is a... But the, the, salty, 
the salty nerd Bible. There's so but, much work that goes on it, behind that no one ever sees. People it. have no idea how much work. Since you're all blurred and you held that up, it looks like it's really dirty. And we're not supposed yeah. to. See <laughs> it looks like dirty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is it, man. This is this it's is all blurred out. <laughs> yeah, the stupid face cam. But yeah, but but uh, it's wild how much work goes into this stuff, and and it it really is frustrating when when our channels seem to nosedive for no reason other than YouTube yep. decides to fuck with the algorithm or something. It's not fair. I'm doing that right now. Let's I had a, a Dune video that took me a month to make and that that's like just all was getting fine views and all of a sudden just for no reason at all. No, no, mm -hmm. no, nothing. Just, just stop getting views. And like it took us 300 hours <laughs> work, you know? Well, well, guys, speaking of revenue from YouTube, we got uh, a super chat from Wendy Hunter for 199. Thank nice. you, Wendy. Hail SP Salty Panel. Hail. Can't wait for Hail. today's show. And of course, we have to acknowledge Jillian N., the queen of gifted subscriptions, <laughs> gifting five Salty Nerd podcast memberships. Guys, that's 11 for the day today. We already hit our goal. Let's uh, go. Thank you nice. all so much for that. Yeah. Get that's, it. That's fantastic. One All right, of the guys. best things that you can do, though, like just to make a point before we we finish up on this topic, is like uh, like I'm I'm very lucky because I get to do it for work, like right. Mm -hmm. So our growth has been pretty consistent through the last couple of years. Um, but what Tim learned, because of course that's who I work for, is that like he he knew that the revenue was going to be up and down, and then it was going to move. The goalposts were going to be moved, which is why he started his website and he started subscriptions on there. So it's for a lot of it, it's not just about the YouTube revenue, it's about finding ways to monetize your work outside of just the YouTube videos. And that sucks that, that you have to do that a lot of the time. But if you're adding content, if you're adding value to the things that you're, that you're giving to people, then there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that. And the best thing you can do is to, is to move outwards. Cause like I said, like for me doing this for work is like, if I, if I was to go now and, and go do something else, I would have to go. If, if I went back, got a regular job, I would just do this for fun and the views would be low and it would be, yeah. it would be very, very small, but it would be for fun. Right. So it's, it's about, if it's looking to make it for work, it's about, monetizing in ways beyond just ad revenue and super chats well you guys know what else is fun talking about disney and how they're <laughs> screwing up their entire business model so excellent guys, transition. yes guys uh in case you've been living under a rock uh they announced that fantastic four has cast julia gardner as a female silver surfer now i, I really like julia gardner as an actress but like i can't see her as like a like you know bodysuit silver like you know herald of galactus um and i know that this is a character from the actual like comic books but at the same time like uh disney conveniently didn't announce this until after the proxy vote had <laughs> right. taken place yeah. exactly. and and so many people are, are are like dude what are you doing marvel because like already we had reports that uh that Kevin Feige was like, we're going to cast Pedro Pascal as Mr. Fantastic because the cast is too white. We need, we need a little bit more color in the cast. And now they're like, okay, now we're going to, to you know, make Silver Surfer a woman. And, and, every, and everyone here is, is just like, you know, they, uh, Disney keeps saying like, oh, we're not woke. We don't even know what woke means. And in fact, I, I want to call this up, uh, uh, this Hollywood Reporter article uh, where Bob Iger uh, talks about the woke Disney criticism. And he's like, we don't even really know what woke means. We're just making stuff. We're just making stuff for a large group of diverse people. Sure, Bob. Uh, yeah, and and all of this comes after like you know like Bob Iger finally wins his proxy battle for the board, um, and it, it's a really frustrating thing for fans because like you keep hearing like oh Marvel's you know uh, stepping back and that they're trying to like you know, you know figure out. Uh, how to give fans more of what they want, capture their old magic, and then they go and announce this stuff for their next big release. So, uh, you know, Odin, the whole thing with like the whole Disney board fight and stuff like that, it was really for the soul of Disney. I know there are a lot of people out there who are happy that Bob Iger won because they're like, just let him destroy it. Let him run it into the ground. And it seems like that's what's happening. So what's your take on this? No, I mean, yeah, I honestly just did not really care too much about the whole proxy fight in general just because i just i think it's gonna take a lot more than even just one person to actually change anything at disney at this point everything is just so entrenched uh the yes men of of Iger, the people that he wants in place are all there so 
you know, all those things are still going to be present, even if either one he's gone or if, you know, somehow Nelson Peltz got, got, you know, brought on. Um, but I, I look at this and I think, okay, these are just a bunch of rich people fighting with each other. Yep. Right. And so it's like, I can't believe that they said what 40 million plus was spent by Iger's team just to fight against it. Like, and just for like propaganda, essentially to try to like support his position. And it's like, I, I, I wish I had $40 million that I could spend on propaganda, right? It's not like, you know, $40 million spent on promoting your movie, something that you've created, but $40 million basically just to prop yourself up. And then immediately after that, you have this announcement of the female Silver Surfer. And again, I'm not a comics person, but I've heard that this is about as obscure as a reference as you can get, like someone who was, who was barely even in the comics, like didn't really have much I, I, of a... I heard she was in four issues yeah. of, of the Silver Surfer run or something like that. And it's that. like, this is what they've Set got to. Set in an alternate universe. Yeah. yeah. And this is this is what they've gotten to, is that they are so desperate that they will either, one, completely just, you know, race swap, gender swap someone on the surface, or two, they won't, and then they'll claim, you see, look, we can do, we can do uh, comic accurate things. But then the comic accurate things, quote unquote comic accurate that they do, is, oh yeah, let's find the like this random female silver surfer and, and let's do that story that everyone's been asking for. It's just, it's so (laughs) ridiculous. And I honestly, I still can't grasp my head around it completely because they've been losing money. They've been bleeding money on these movies. They've been wasting so much money. And so whenever these announcements come out, I think, okay, that's going to be another hundred million dollars or so down the drain. Like how long can you do that? Like how long can they continue to, Piss it, away. Um, it, it feels I'm sorry if it, it feels to me like they're they're trying to like take what we say we want which mm-hmm. is a character from the comics and you keep it in canon which I guess technically they're giving us but they have to find that one character that they know is just going to annoy everybody it's like <laughs> right. oh, you know it's like oh well Female Silver Server was in the comics back in the Golden Age, back I guess in the day. You're right. <laughs> yeah. And but you know, so we're gonna put her in there, but we're still not giving you what you want. So you know, well, let, 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 let me crazy. throw this. Let me throw this to Tom. Uh, Tom, you know, uh, Kevin Feige famously, uh, you know, brought about the MCU, and it's famously flopped, especially with the proof of the Marvels. You know, the proofs in the pudding, and yet he keeps going back to this like like what do you think is the strategy here i don't know i mean kevin has bought into this woke crap so is bob i mean even though he can't define it like a woman he still (laughs) bought into it and uh frankly we know what they're doing and they know what they're doing or they wouldn't have waited to announce that because there was another thing that dropped right after the boat too and it was that tales of the empire Mm-hmm. Uh, cartoon and if you watch literally in the first five seconds you're like oh here we go misunderstood strong women you know right off the bat it's about two women who uh are, are seemingly going to become sith of some sort uh who have had bad bad things happen to them well it's, of course, it's about it's about victims. the uh the the chick that got turned into the the witch in the ahsoka series it's yeah yeah thing. again a I character a nobody gives a shit about yeah that you know, and that, that they're just continuing to try to make Star Wars a girl brand. I'm I don't care anymore about Star Wars. How do we get back to Star it? Wars? But yeah, they exactly. were gonna go to right. they were gonna go to verse with uh Silver Surfette no matter what. Right. because uh, we also found out that there was an African American uh actor who was in the running to play it, and he even thought he had the job. Uh so it turns out that's not the case unless they are gonna have a male version at some point and they just haven't called this guy yet. But I as don't. long as he's painted silver, I don't care what color he is. See, and that's the thing, I don't think anybody would have cared if he was black or white or whatever. They're nope. just like, wait, the silver surfer is a dude. And I think the other problem we have here with the silver surfer is they don't even probably know what surfing is. Right. <laughs> so to them, the only thing surfing has anything to do with is the internet. So they'll probably end up turning her into some TikToker. Oh, right. she's a TikTok and silver TikToker. Yeah, yeah she'll funny. be all like, you know, LOL, feeling cute, might buzz a planet or feed it to Galactus. <laughs> uh, you, you know, Brett, um, a, a big issue with Hollywood nowadays seems to be like they, they don't know who their audience is. Mm. They're, they, they keep ignoring like what the audience people want and giving them what they sh- 
believe they should want right mm. so like it, it's about you know Dis- disney bob Iger will come out and say like oh like we don't we're, we're not uh quit putting any emphasis on messaging we're just trying to make entertaining stuff for people and yet you see this come out and it's like it's totally about messaging because it, it's about you know forcing diversity into a major hollywood production that you need to force the audience to accept as opposed to giving the audience stuff that they genuinely want so yeah. what's your take uh my the worst part of it to me is like it's the wink wink nudge nudge where they pretend like they don't know they're doing it and what i mean by that is like yes the character exists in four issues, but Norrin Rad has been the silver surfer that everyone who grew up reading comics would know. And to pretend like replacing them is actually something that they're doing unconsciously. And in the first movie, in the first film that they're doing after the Fantastic Four enter the MCU, no one buys it. No one buys it. And the other problem I have with most of this these days is once you start leaving the realm of these main major characters, unless you have a really, really good director. And what I mean by that is like you like whenever I point out, I say, look, look, nobody's going to care about the Thunderbolts. It's going to bomb. I don't think anybody's going to care. And then people say, well, people loved Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm like, yeah, but James Gunn knows what he's doing. He knew what he was doing back then, and he had 10 times the goodwill that they have now. Now all you have is disinterest and apathy. The first thing you should be doing to rebuild that interest is to go back to characters that everybody loved from their childhood because you can build back on it. And they're not doing that because they are putting the message of what they're trying to sell to you ahead of actual good movie making, or at least good movie casting. Yeah, so um, Brian... The director, speaking of directors, the director of the Fantastic Four movie, Matt Shankman, he basically is a TV director who's being kind of like upscaled to like a feature film director. And the reason Marvel's using him is because he directed a couple episodes of WandaVision. But, uh, you know, he was also on Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, Succession, The Boys, a bunch of other TV Star Trek 4. TV directors aren't known for being like, you know, auteurs. They're kind of like plug and play uh, you know, they show up, they they get the stuff done, they move on. And this seems like one of those things where like he wasn't really behind the casting of, of this. It was like right. Marvel forced this on him and now he has to to go and like make it work because he's just he does what he's told. He's not like an actual like filmmaker, like someone like Sam Raimi or, you know, like uh, the, the these uh, big time directors who Marvel can't really control. Uh, now you are our, our comic book channel expert on this because you're on the DC <laughs> Comics channel. What's your what's your take on on this strategy of you, you know the the forced diversity in the casting process? And do you think is Fantastic Four a popular enough franchise where people are going to put up with it? Uh, before, before, every time you say I'm like the expert on comics, uh, I'm not an expert on comics. I have a, a failing channel that talks about comics, but <laughs> um, I do have an opinion on this. Uh, the forced, you know, the forced diversity into things is such a weird topic because, like, part of, part of it is you know that they're pushing a message, and like, there are people inside Disney and Marvel that are actively trying to de uh, manify, you know, remove, you know, <laughs> as many men as they could from these big properties that are coming up because. You know it's malicious like they're maliciously trying to remove men from these roles so that the next generation of fans which th- they think there will be but there won't be because they're failing but they think that the next generation of fans will associate those characters with their new dei um inserts um but then there's also people that are just, that are just stupid and they're going along with that malicious message because they think that diversity brings more money because you get more audience members that way like i don't know if bob Iger's comments were actually honest or not but you gotta you got to think that there are people that are in positions of power that are listening to all the diversity experts the malicious group and they honestly believe that if there is more diversity and more in different types of people in the in the movie or the TV show and in these comic book movies that they will somehow bring in more audience, right? That they will somehow get more people to watch because they can identify with people on the screen. Um, that is, that is so short sighted 
because in their mind it's all you know it's about money they want more and more people to watch they think that people are so dumb and so racist that they can't associate themselves with superman because superman's a white male they can't associate themselves with silver surfer because silver surfer because silver surfer is a, a man um but they don't understand that the comic books the hero's journey the stories that people are listening to are about inspiration and none of us i've never read comic books where i'm identifying with the per, with the character because the color of their skin or if they have a penis or not it's the content of their character it's what they do it's the story that inspires me i have i don't you know it's never been about what color that person is or what gender they are it's about what they do with it so when you take something that i grew up reading that had a look that had a vibe they had a character already in place and you completely change it for your message you think you're you know they, because they think they're going to actually get more people to become fans of that character because they look like them i think that that is um i think i think that's short-sighted i think they're actually thinking that people are so stupid that they can't see past you know uh what the person looks like they can't identify because that person's not black or a woman yeah. or whatever it's silly uh, yeah vader um yeah you know south park made a famous meme out of like disney strategy where it's like put uh -huh. a chicken it make her lame and gay yeah, yeah. and I, I i just feel like disney keeps reinforcing that that meme like like what's your I, take on this i i am picking it make her gay I just want to say that I'm very thankful to the guys over at South Park because I have Cartman to identify with and <laughs> I can see myself with in, 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 in the South Park world because, you know, I, I, I do. I like, I, I really identify and, and want to be Parkman or, or Cartman. God, I can't even talk right now. But uh, yeah. Um, what was the question? I forget. Uh, about like how Disney has reinforced the meme. To become oh yeah man. yeah there, i mean every time Iger opens his mouth he just he just solidifies everything that came out of that south park episode right i mean you 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 can't he can't he couldn't do it any better i think because he just keeps on they keep on doubling down and they keep on making everything that they said in that south park episode real and, and more true every every single day it's 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 crazy how much they keep doing this it's it's wild i i don't understand why they can't just turn on the internet and and see it i mean it, it just it just tells right. you that they that they don't care they they have a job and their job is to to uh promote this dei diversity nonsense that everybody in the planet except for that one percent fringe group of idiots hates and they're blaming you know, it on fans. And, and, and that, we that's have, why they're blaming on fans. We have to quit giving those people a mouthpiece. You, you know, that's yeah. that's the whole problem. These people are too vocal. And I almost think with people like us, maybe we need to just quit talking about it. Maybe we need to maybe we just need to ignore these people. Well, then we wouldn't have anything on. to talk about. I know it's, <laughs> but you know, we, we gotta we gotta maybe we gotta come up yeah. with some new topics. They maybe, think that the money maybe, they're losing maybe, maybe is because to, fans like us are holding out. Here's yeah. the thing is, do you guys I, think you're laboring under the idea that they're actually losing any money? This is where we come in with all the DEI groups and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like there's sweet baby inks for Hollywood too. And this is what we've been trying yeah. to tell people about the Black Rocks and all these other companies. Mm -hmm. That's where the money comes from. They know that these are loss leaders, right? Mm -hmm. They know that they're probably not going to make the money that they're hoping for. And that's where you can go back and listen to certain interviews with Kathleen Kennedy is a great mm -hmm. example where she's sitting there talking about the future of Star Wars isn't 50 year old white dudes right we all remember that interview and what she's saying there is if you listen to the rest of the interview she's saying like in the future these kids will appreciate what we're doing for them right yeah. so you have the money coming in from all these dei groups you have all these people who believe all this bullshit so it's the cyclical circle of a circle jerk basically in hollywood right now and that's why bob is sitting there pulling the crap that he is because he is one of the main people that are invested in this stuff. Yeah, and if you guys really want to get a good sense of how Disney has gone woke and why they continue to do this stuff, Film Threat has a great series of articles called The D-Files, uh, all about uh, their inside sources, telling them about how activists took over Disney from the inside out, 
and why they yeah. keep doing this stuff. So I'd highly recommend you guys check that out. And speaking of checking stuff out, we got some super chats that uh, we need to hit up. Fluffy Panda, member for 11 months. Thank you so much, Fluffy Panda. Nice. I prefer my twin melon gamers with big fluffy beards. <laughs> Woo! Yes. That's one person for you, baby. You're in the minority, right. but we love well, you. Well, at least I'm, I'm like Fluffy likes at least one of us on the panel. Yeah. So, you know, that's and Gavin Blackburn, a member for 12 months, one year. Thank you, Gavin <laughs> Blackburn. Disney is content for the 3%. I disagree. It's, I think it's like one, maybe 1.5. 1. 5. Yeah. Yeah. And guys, they just, uh, they, they're just really good at Twitter. So, so yeah, yeah there are. We got Magna Defender 98 for $10. And this is his first ever super first one. Chat. So hey, welcome, you, Magna welcome. Defender. In 2024, Hollywood execs still use the Koof as a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. The people in the Koof is over camp is way higher than the Koof is still an issue crowd. And again, 1% of America is stuck in 2020 land. Shrug. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're also in California and there's probably a higher percentage of nutcases that are still working. Yeah, 100%. In California. Yeah, I saw I, a guy. I saw a guy <laughs> yesterday in his car with the cloth mask mm -hmm. and the face shield in his closed car. Yeah, there's there's always that one percent of people. Like I'll go to work. You know, we have a big people. There's the, I have four thousand people at, that it works at my casino, and there's always that few people every shift that you see wandering the back halls and they got a dumb mask on. I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you wearing that thing? Do you not know that your little piece of cloth isn't isn't doing anything? But you know, you know, whatever. It, it didn't work that. before, and it's at this point, not working now. It's at making point, them feel it. more yeah. secure, man. Yeah. Just leave like them alone. Hey, I think I saw one of those guys on a Robert Meyer Burnett live stream yesterday. So let me see. Uh, <laughs> Justin Martin's just gifted five salty nerd podcast memberships, bringing nice. the episode total to sixteen gifted memberships. Thank Sweet. you so nice. much, guys. Justin Martin's. Let's that's go for awesome. twenty. Let's hit twenty today. Now, Fluffy Panda for five dollars. Mm. There's only one Silver Surfer, and Bodhi is his name. Long live the Sways. That's right. Oh, and before I forget, <laughs> I value Brian's opinion as much as a vegan's at a steakhouse. <laughs> that's that's my favorite it's one. A good today. policy to have. Good. Yep. That's a good one. <laughs> Thank you, Fluffy Panda. I love you too, buddy. I, I, I really <laughs> describes Brian's opinions. Right there. And you fucked that oh. niche for one nine nine. Superman came from another planet. <laughs> OMG. <laughs> I like this, this guy. This stuff this was is... happening. Remember when uh, when they started casting Superman Legacy and everyone was uh, kind of shocked at like how they did not seem to diversify the casting as much oh, as yeah. they thought they were. Uh, and even when they did, like even Perry White getting, they got Wendell Pierce as Perry White and everyone was universally excited because Wendell Pierce is a fantastic actor sure. and stuff like this. The, like in Bob Iger for Disney, I mean, everyone, I mean, it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but he was always talking about this stuff. And before Ike Perlmutter left, it was like Ike Perlmutter was able to kind of put a governor on him and keep him from doing this stuff to the cast initially because they knew they couldn't get the MCU started unless they casted their original characters in a classical fashion. But now they believe that despite the falling revenue and the lack of actual income coming in, they think that it's going to hold. And I maintain, I said, nobody has any interest in Thunderbolts. The, when they said that they were going to make an Eternals 2, everyone was like, huh? When, like, there is no well, goodwill left for any well, of this. E even in the early stages of the mm. MCU, you know, you had a uh, race swap with Nick Fury. Mm. Sam Jackson comes in, but no, nobody thought that nobody that cared. was anything because he was cool. It's like, yeah. and it was, Jackson's and it's cool. a, it was before this was a conversation. I was, I was talking with people the other day. I said, I've been watching Merlin again on, yeah. <laughs> on, on online, and Merlin race swapped Guinevere in 2008. Nobody cared because there was no yeah. interviews where directors and actors were going around talking about the virtuous well, nature. Well, also, of doing nobody watched like that. that show back when it was. Hey, it got five <laughs> seasons. It got five seasons. Yeah, you know, no, you're right. I, no, I didn't Brent's watch it then, right, but I'm yeah. watching it now. <laughs> Brett's <laughs> right, and I've said this. You know, diversity has always been a part of Hollywood. Cool. I mean, the, the, the you know, like the LGBTQ representation. It's like. I'd like to remind people that everything you've watched forever in Hollywood has been made by mostly gay people. Yep. Just so you know. <laughs> yep. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's only it, mostly like it's gay. New. Only mostly gay. Mostly. Partially only gay. mostly. All right, guys. I, uh, speaking, I, of, speaking of gay stuff, uh, <laughs> let's talk a, a little bit about uh, the lack of money that Indiana Jones made. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. uh, I'm just so, gonna go away in that. Yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Forbes has an excellent article that basically went is it excellent all, 
all of these. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> Valiant and all, and Odin and all those guys have been saying this for, uh, for a well, while well, now. Yeah. Just, just let, let me run my show, goddamn it. Right, so, uh, Indiana Jones. So and that's like, why we're what, an hour in. We're just getting to this. What, yes. what, what, what Forbes did here was they they looked at all the public filings that the UK requires movie studios to do, and they came up with a number that basically suggests that Indiana Jones lost at least. 130 million dollars uh you know compared to like you know the other movies and stuff like that but in addition to that this doesn't count for marketing expenses or anything of that nature so the the speculation here is that indiana jones 5 was a huge huge loss for disney now we have our own uh numbers guys on the panel so i'm going to throw this to odin odin what's your take on this article and what's your estimation of what the actual loss of indiana jones 5 was yeah, the reason why I said that is this really a great article is because it runs with the headline of one like 130 million, and I'm like, <laughs> they wish it was only 130 right? that's million. That's what they lost just on advertising, that's, probably. Yeah, I mean, that's like that's at least 100 million dollars off of what the actual losses are. That's that's being generous. Yeah, I, I have the you know I've, I've broken this down, and it's interesting, right? Because you see that range of potential budgets, right? It's upwards of closer to 400 million dollars, as low as 295. And again, I don't buy the, that 295 number at all. Uh, but I, I've broken those numbers down, and I've taken into account domestic take, usually being about 55 percent, international about 40 percent, China about 25 percent. And based off of those, if the budget is 295. So being very generous there because there's no way that it's not uh, that it is that uh, you're still looking at two hundred and sixty four million dollars in losses. If the budget was two ninety five, uh, if the budget was closer to three fifty, which it probably was, then the losses go up to three hundred forty six million dollars. And then if it's a whopping four hundred million dollar budget, then it's four hundred and twenty one million dollars in losses. And so wow. we're talking about probably close to three hundred plus million dollars in losses when you take into account not just the budget, but also marketing cost. And so that's why like this article drives me a bit nuts because even though it's you know admission of loss, it's still them not being honest. It, it's still them not telling you what's actually going on. And you know, as as Tom said, right, Valiant's been covering this for a very long time. I've been covering this for a very long time, right? That th just how much financial loss that Disney has has been seeing over the last, especially last year. I mean, every film that they put out there with only one you could potentially argue, but we still don't even know everything about that movie being Guardians 3. Yeah. Only one made money, and it wasn't even a lot. Even if it did make it, it it's like chump change. So I just it, it drives me crazy when these articles come out because, yes, it's great that they're admitting massive losses, but, I mean, when you're giving only maybe half or a third of what the actual loss is, you're still covering for Disney at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Brett, you, you know, one of the weird things about this is like people will say like, Oh, Indiana Jones had to shut down during COVID, which increased cost. Uh, Harrison Ford got injured, which means that they had to de delay a bunch of stuff that increased cost. Uh, they'll be making all these excuses as to why it didn't make money, but it just comes down to the fact that Kathleen Kennedy is a terrible producer and James Mangold just couldn't keep this thing un un under his reign. So what's your take on this? Do you think that uh, Odin's numbers are closer to the reality than what Forbes is reporting? Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, is nobody was interested. Uh, you had falling interest after uh, Indiana Jones in 2008. And those numbers, even when I ran them and I looked at it, and of course, I don't do the nearly as in-depth of a look into it, but I said, there's no way it's it's only $130 million. It's just my expectations are so low for the media that them admitting anything, I'm just like, well, good for them. They actually did half of something good once in a while. I, I appreciate that. I kind of felt the same way when they published that really long article about all the problems going on at Marvel. And I was like, now, if only you had done this when the problems actually started, maybe they could have started actually course correcting. But if nobody in the media holds the company to the fire by actually trying to get them to make the changes they need to, then what do you expect to change? Nothing's going to end up any different. And when you look at that number and you look at what's going on, not just with Lucasfilm, but also with Marvel and everything like that, and you try to pretend like there's any amount of interest in these properties anymore, it, it fails. And, and what we were talking about earlier, going back to like the previous topic, when we were talking about why are they doing this, for instance, with the race swaps, why are they bolstering these properties that aren't making them any money? And then we were talking about like they're doing it so that the next generation will believe like those like that those characters are the ones that will end up becoming the pop, you know, the ones that everyone's heard of. The next generation is checking out wholesale. They're on YouTube. They're on Twitch. They're on Kick. 
they're not going to see Indiana Jones five. The and I I particularly hated that movie. Like more more than I think it was the worst movie of the year that I saw. I think it was like the number one bad movie last year. And kids have no interest in this stuff. But what is the point of IP if you're not going to just continually drag it out from its grave and compl- and continue to violate it, which is what they keep doing. Yeah, um, Tom, how much money does Kathleen Kennedy have to lose Disney before she gets replaced? Kathleen Kennedy can do whatever she wants. She could literally walk up, take a dump in front of the Magic Kingdom, run around the castle naked, screaming, I am the voice of my own God. And they would just say, she's having a bad day. (laughs) Um, Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, at this point, like, look, we can we can give her a mulligan on Star Wars and Willow, I guess, because she had nothing to do with those when they came out. But this is the one I love to look at and go, what's your excuse? You were the one who this was supposed to be your baby, right? Like you have been there since the beginning. You were the producer with your husband on the first three, four films. Sorry, I always forget that. that was that fourth film? <laughs> but now that this fifth film is out, that makes that fourth film retroactively much better. And what's your excuse? Because going back to that fourth film, now that I bring it up, the problem with that fourth film was Steven had given up at that point. Because he had been badgered for over a decade by George Lucas to make another Indiana Jones movie. And he's just like, eh, I think it ended just fine. Them riding into the sunset. I don't want to do another one. I don't want to do another one. And George is like, no, no, no. Trust me, aliens. And uh, <laughs> and he's like, fine, George, whatever. We'll do it. And they did. And that really was what, what, it, was what it was. And when you have Kathleen Kennedy here and the, the moment Spielberg walked, that's when I knew that something was wrong. Right, because it's always like as long as Spielberg's there, we should be okay. Because now she's making one without George, so we don't have any chance of aliens showing up. Right, so to me, I was like, okay, it was kind of like going down the right path, and then all of a sudden, Steven's gone, and Mister Kadish here had his amazing tweet that you know Mangold made himself look like a fool over. (laughs) Because I mean, even if he was half right on certain things and wrong about one thing, and a few other things weren't exactly on, it doesn't matter. It was right enough. But at that point, the writing was on the wall. And if Kathleen Kennedy can't even produce, literally produce what she's known for, then what good is she? And I mean, everybody has to start asking this in Hollywood. Now, nobody's going to say anything but us because, as I keep pointing out to people, Kathleen Kennedy is one of the most successful, powerful people in Hollywood, right? Kevin Feige's right alongside her now. There's certain people that are just untouchable. She's even even more untouchable than Spielberg is. People need to realize that Spielberg's stock has fallen, but because she's the head of Lucasfilm, she's still way up there, right? Like, I don't think Bob is ever going to, nobody's ever going to publicly within the company say anything about her, right? They're just not. When she leaves, she's going to be gone. At the end of the day, what difference does it make? Because nothing is going to change. Uh, it's already destroyed. You can try to revive Star Wars in five, ten years from now, but what good is it going to do? It is yeah. now below any level of what it used to be. You took the greatest franchise of all time, the biggest one of all time, and turned it into crap. Mm-hmm. And then you took Indiana Jones, which was arguably one of the, you know, probably within the top 10 or 20 biggest franchises of all time, and turned it into crap too. And let's not even get started on Willow. Right. So anyway, uh, that being said, that's about all I have to say on that. Yeah, uh, uh, Brian. So like Lucasfilm (laughs) has has a big track record of basically losing money on their franchise. Started with Star Wars. Willow was a hundred million dollar tax write off for Disney. You can't even watch Willow anymore. Uh, This Indiana Jones thing was supposed to be. I couldn't even watch it then. This Indiana Jones thing was supposed to be like Kathleen Kennedy's like great triumph. And it ended up being like a huge loss uh, for Lucasfilm and Disney. But then you look at like all the losses Marvel's racking up, all the losses Pixar's racking up. It doesn't look like anything on the entertainment side of Disney is actually making any money. And and yet they uh, the board just uh, you, you know recertified Bob Iger uh, as as the the leader of of you know the ship. And this is all his fault. So, like, you know, I know you own a lot of Disney stock. <laughs> how, how how upset are you about, like, you know, the, the future outlook for Disney? It's more than half of my portfolio. Try to get rid like, of it, dude. It's like 68% of my portfolio. Put it into the peacock. 
Um, Put it into the cock, Brian. <laughs> I do. I do. I do like the peacock. Dogecoin. I do. Uh, cool. I have Dogecoin. Dogecoin <laughs> is uh, doing better actually today than it was uh, two months ago, which is fascinating. Um, it's actually make it's actually rising again but yeah um i'm upset that i was really hoping that we would get some kind of movement on the nelson pelts thing not just for content but yeah for the stock um perfect you know best case scenario nelson pelts his team jumps in and um actually de and makes changes a la you know um you know the zaz man and things start to content starts to become better and people go back to watching it and disney stock rises and you know blah blah, blah. most likely it would have been more like a temporary adjustment where it would have been a little better but people's opinions of it um would have been initially higher which means the stock would have came up and it wouldn't have it would have allowed me to sell because there was a moment there where i was uh, about just just shy of five dollars away from my average buy-in, and I could have I could have sold my stock without taking a loss. But then the Nelson Peltz thing uh, it failed. Iger took back control, and the stock dropped again. So I was I was it was it was getting there. It was like doo -doo -doo. like here's where I need to be, and it was like this. Yeah. And Nelson Peltz happened. It was like Arr. so it sucks. Um, but you know, I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that we we this year, there's an election year, and someone gets elected into office that uh, the stock market has a favorable view of. If you know what I'm talking about, and um, and we see a change in our economy, and maybe that maybe maybe the stock market uh, makes a turn, and I can completely and totally pull out of all my positions because I'm over it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just over it. And, and you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, the whole fight over the board of Disney with Nelson Peltz is like Nelson Peltz wanted to reshape the company to help investors like Brian be profitable. And yeah. the Disney board was like, nah, dude, we don't want any of that profitability. <laughs> Not We're, already rich. We're already rich. We want to use our propaganda. We're fine. Uh, Screw those yeah. guys. <laughs> real, Screw real the quick. shareholders. <laughs> Major Chai Chai for one salty nerd gifted membership. Thank you so much, Major Chai Chai. Really appreciate That's you. That's where the real stock is. The real stock is in YouTube memberships and Patreon supporters. <laughs> right, you That's the real stock. You yeah, you get, you, you get more out of it. It's cheaper. You can get more out of it. All yeah. right, guys. So speaking of getting more out of something, they're trying to milk the Matrix for yet Ugh. another movie. To, to get more who the of hell that. asked for this uh, it, especially after like how nobody bad who watched resurrections <laughs> yeah, exactly. oh i actually i can break down matrix and no erections real quick <laughs> right this movie that movie the fourth film all that was about was an old dude who has a date with an old flame but he can't get it up anymore so he keeps <laughs> popping blue pills that's the whole movie go back and watch it again knowing that and you'll be like he's right Oh, well, guys, I, I, I hate to be on PC, but since we have Brian on, on the channel, I think I can get away with it. The okay. minute the, the minute the Wachowskis got rid of their dicks, they lost all their time. Oh, wow. 100%. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, they, they, yeah. What is that about? How is it that these two want these once very talented, very unique filmmakers, they lost their penis and all of their work becomes became just terrible, horrible, unwatchable garbage? Answer. Because you guys assumed they were great filmmakers. Here's the thing. They made one good movie. Yep. One what? good movie. Really? They, they wrote V for Vendetta, right? I love V for Vendetta. Uh, yeah, I love V for Vendetta. That's based on a graphic novel. See, that's yeah. the thing. Everything else they've made that he was even remotely yeah. close to being successful, yeah. like V for Vendetta or uh, Speed Racer, are based on yeah. other properties. I, I, even I, The actually, Matrix, um, you could look at it and go, that's technically a, a hodgepodge of a bunch of like yeah. sci-fi yeah. and anime tropes, too. I, yeah. Actually, Tom, I, I'd argue Bound was was a really good movie, um, but uh, I want to throw this to Brian. Brian, uh, after the utter failure of Matrix Four, uh, I, I know that WB's desperate for like more franchises, more successes, stuff like that. Um, but it seems to me like going back to the Matrix uh, might not be the best idea. But considering that it could be like a complete reboot or like they're not using Keanu Reeves or Carrie Ann Moss or anything like that. 
might be a good way to go because you know the matrix is kind of like a uh, a wide ranging world that you can uh, have a lot of playgrounds in. Uh, but what's your take on this? Do you think audiences are actually going to care about a Matrix Five? Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Okay. First off, I think audiences will one hundred percent care about care about Matrix Five. Matrix Four was garbage, um, but there's a lot of people out there that still adore the the, the trilogy, and I think there's more stories to tell, and maybe it's good that we don't need to go back to the, the original cast um i'm over carrie ann moss like i don't i don't need yeah. to see her anymore on screen i'm over it i'm good dude um but most importantly for this is the guy directing it drew goddard is awesome like i don't know if you guys ever seen cabin in the woods but that is it's fun one of that's like my guilty pleasure i love that that's did stupid. the margin too right yeah, he did the Martian. You know who's um, also another great director, James Mangold. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! I mean, but but hold up, hold up. He did he did the Good Place, which is an amazing TV series. One like one of my top five. Um, he did Bad Times at at uh, at the El Royale, oh, yeah. which I watched mm. recently, and I love that movie. Mm. Loved love it. Though. So Brian, uh, you, you know Drew Goddard's from the uh, the Joss Whedon school, like like he was someone yeah. that Joss kind of like mentored and. Yeah, didn't up. didn't Joss and him work on the cabin together? Yeah, yeah, Joss yeah. Uh, produced it for him. Yeah. It's like his directorial debut. Uh, but uh, I, I want to throw this to to Brett real quick. Uh, you know, Brett, uh, the Wach this is going to be the first Matrix that the Wachowskis, at least one of the Wachowskis, uh, is involved in directing. Yeah, and a lot of people are saying like that's a good thing. You know, Brian just kind of espoused like how good uh, uh, Drew Goddard is. But can he kind of come in and revitalize this thing? Because the thing that made the original Matrix so incredible, number one, it was a very straightforward hero's journey. But number two, it was innovative in the way that Star Wars was initially innovative in terms of special effects and stuff like that. And it feels like, especially like after watching the fourth one, it just feels so dated. It feels like it was like something from the 90s that got rejected. You yeah, know, it brought nothing I'll, new to the table. It, it brought nothing new to the table at all. And that's the thing, like when you think about bullet time and what that did for special effects in the 90s and stuff like that, uh, I, d I don't think they should do it. I, I think they should leave it alone. And I kind of, I felt the same way for the most part about what they're doing with the crow and what they're doing <laughs> with um, Blade. For, uh, like what I would like to see, if you're going to do a movie of this type, the, one of the issues that I have with the with the upcoming crow movie and what i had a problem with with matrix resurrections was that it has none of the class and none of the grit that was there in the original film it doesn't have the green color palette it doesn't have uh the dingy tone to it that made it what it was and blade was the same way everything that's produced today has this clean feel that almost belies what the point of the matrix was when you watch the original film if they were to shoot it on film and and go to practical locations and shoot there rather than do a whole bunch of sets i would love to see them do that i don't think they will i think it will come out looking like another clean polished hollywood product that has absolutely no soul mm -hmm. and i don't know if a change in director is really going to going to do that because for the most part when things get above a certain price tag for blockbusters they have a lot of films that just look alike. I'm just, I don't have any interest in it. I said they should just focus on making the matrix like theme parks. Like I know there's one, but they should just turn the matrix into interactive fan experiences. Sure. At, uh, That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you know, uh, go ahead, Matt. Uh, I was, I don't know what, who you're going to, but I'm, I'm just going to say this. Um, the Wachowskis or whoever they're Hollywood, they're, they're, God, I can't talk. Um, they're, making sequels to the wrong series you know you know there there's 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 a movie out there that is rife and ready for for them to make at least a a, a, a trilogy out of that we've all seen and loved and, and watched before and that's uh jupiter ascending and um we that's <laughs> if, if we want to watch a good movie you need to go back and watch jupiter ascending yeah. so I love we dogs. can so, Come so out. we can, so we can flush that world out. Uh, that's what we need to do because yes. it's ready. It's sitting there. It's ready for us to get a sequel to. We, we need to know what, what's going on there. I, I, I love that movie. I mean, I, I don't know how you guys can sit here and not love that movie because it's, it's a <laughs> fucking masterpiece. 
And I want to know what's going on with Mila Kunis and Dog Boy <laughs> and his ice and his air skates. Mila and, Kunis is in know, trouble right now because of Ashton Kutcher and all the well, human trafficking. Then she stuff. she needs she needs a vehicle to make a comeback. I heard I we're right? getting a sequel and, with Amy and, Adams. Yeah, Jupiter Ascending is it. <laughs> you know, Jupiter Ascending two needs to happen. Jupiter and Ascending and two, the, Jupiter Descending. And, yes. if, and if the Wachowskis want to make a movie that we're all going to get behind and love and support. They need to do this. We're we're over the Matrix movies, guys. These are old. Let's, let's I saw, go back to that world of Jupiter yeah. Ascending and have some fun. Let's go. I saw somebody mention the Animatrix in the chat. Yes, uh, they should do that. Same thing with Indiana Jones. Just bring back young Indy. Uh, well, just bring uh, back both of those. Yeah, starring Sean Patrick Flannery. Yeah. Uh, so, Odin, uh, you, you know, one of the criticisms levied against Matrix 4 where people were like, oh, Matrix 4 would have made so much money yeah. If it hadn't been for the Koof and and Warner Brothers making the boneheaded decision to do day and date on streaming, right? So like they released it on streaming the same time it was out in the theaters, and I think Matrix Four only made like 140 million dollars uh, in the theaters, uh, which, which was like you, you know like a almost uh, like had like 190 million dollar budget, something like that. Um, but uh, having watched Matrix Four, I, I'm like. I'm surprised it made that much in the theater because it was legitimately stupid, especially like uh, as a Matrix fan. It's like they just went in a completely different direction with it that made zero sense. But what's your take on uh, people saying that the uh, streaming uh, simultaneous release hurt it? I, I always hate that excuse uh, because obviously there is something to it, like to a certain degree. But then you just need to look at more recent, uh, a more recent release like the Five Nights at Freddy's film. That film was day and date release and actually ended up doing better than what they had expected in the theaters and actually had a pretty decent run theatrically. I mean, I think it did better than what many people would have thought. And it also happened to do well on on streaming, right? If people want to see a film in theaters, like they will go out of their ways to go and see it. And if the argument is, well, X amount of people saw it on streaming, and so those could have been people that would have seen it otherwise, well, you don't know that, right? You, you can't prove that those people would have actually gone out to spend extra cash to see an individual film versus they already have the streaming service, and so they're just accessing something that they're not paying anything extra for, right? And that that's the other part of, like... That whole that whole thing that just drives me nuts because no one can actually prove that uh, one is actually impacting the other in a direct way. And then as far as the Koof is concerned, I look at Major Resurrections and when it came out, and I had forgotten how close it was to another film that came out called Spider Man No Way Home, which opened to six hundred million dollars worldwide, had made over a billion. I think we forget this. It made over a billion dollars two weeks in. It had a billion dollars in two weeks, and that was a week after two West Side Story. And the excuse for that and for all these things was, oh, it's because of COVID, it's because of COVID. And all of a sudden, hey, a movie that people actually have interest in, that people actually want to see comes out, that actually gives fan service and gives people what they want to see. Oh, wait a minute. Turns out that's how you make money. $600 million in the first week worldwide. So, yeah, this, this, this I hate the excuses so much. And it's <laughs> it's the fact that they're still using it is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Tom, what's your take on Matrix 5? And should uh, Warner Brothers just take the L on this and move on to a new franchise? I looked into this a little bit because, like, this makes no sense to me just like it does to you guys. Because, like, Kong and Dune were other examples of mo movies that came out at streaming at the same time and still managed to make money. In fact, Dune is proving and Kong is proving that, you know, those films are going to have very decent box offices at the end of the run of their new sequels because, you know, the, the first films were anticipated and wanted. I think there's so many levels to this matrix thing that it's so stupid. Uh, first of all, I think village Roadshow is the ones who's really behind making the sequel. Cause we got to remember that's the production company that made the film and they sued Warner brothers over the last one's day and date shit. Um, so they were part of that whole thing too. So I think that they're just going to go through with this no matter what. And if we remember when they first announced that matrix, you know, reboot, they said, this is all going to be part of a trilogy. So don't think that they didn't have plans to go forward with this. They're replacing all the old actors with new actors, and that's how they're going to be able to do it cheaper. Um, so that's one thing. And it, at, at the end of the day, it's not going to be made for anybody who's a true fan of the series. It's just going to be made to retain the rights to the franchise and keep it going. Because they even told the Wachowskis back then they were going to do it with or without them, and they're probably better off without them. Because, yeah, sure, Bound was a decent film and Matrix was good, but really how many people have ever really seen or heard of Bound? <laughs> and outside of that, we could sit here and debate all day long on the rest of their 
films because unless they were based on an IP, they failed miserably in theaters. In fact, as much as you liked Jupiter Ascending, Matt, I think that movie cost, it was like one of the most expensive films at the time. I don't even know why they were still giving these two money, right? Because it's just like they hadn't made a hit. Even Matrix 2 and 3 showed that they didn't really have anything. Like they, they're all their ideas were in the first Matrix, and clearly two and three, they're they're trying to to make something that's not there because nobody really cares about. I mean, we 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 talk about you know how Aliens only has one or two movies. I mean, and Terminator only has two movies. Well, the Matrix really does only have one movie, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Right? There is no C that 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 ends there because they screw it up from there on yeah, out. But, but they have mechs fighting Sentinels. It's pretty cool. I don't care. <laughs> it, is, it is so stupid. And the last film was even dumber. And again, I think this is just some sort of rights retainer issue or a contractual thing where they had a trilogy set up. In fact, I was even speculating that the whole reason we're getting Constantine 2 20 years after the fact is because I bet you five bucks. Hell, I'll bet you 20 bucks that the reason that uh, Keanu even considered signing on to the Matrix 4 was because they, they, they dangled that Constantine 2 in front of him. Whether that was part of the deal or not, I is don't that know. Still happening? It's supposedly it? still happening, right? And that's what I'm saying. That's the only thing that made sense to me as to like why in the world would Warner Brothers even consider making a sequel to that, other than they want to stay in the Keanu Reeves business. You know what I mean? Like studios will do that, right? They'll make a movie for a, an actor just to keep them happy. It's like, sure, sign on to three Matrix movies, and we'll give you your Constantine too. Sure, yeah. right? But the deal might be he has to make two or three of those Matrix movies first. See, and that's the other thing is I heard recently, and this is why I'm wondering, because they were going to make a Bill and Ted 4, but now that got pushed back because of Keanu's schedule. So that makes me think that maybe, just maybe, and I don't even know if he's going to star in this thing. He probably just has an obligatory appearance in it of some sort to hand off the torch to the to the chick that's going to take over for him. <laughs> uh, so, guys, can we get the hashtag Jupiter descending going somewhere? Because we need uh, we we need more Channing Tatum vehicles. <laughs> I'm looking at. I just made a post about how uh, I want a uh, new Jupiter Ascending movie, and I'm trying to get public public interaction with it. And I put this really awesome GIF of Channing Tatum with his black angel wings taking off there at the end. What That's, was, uh, was, what was Channing dope. Tatum's last movie? Was it the Dog movie? I like the Dog movie. I think so. <laughs> I think I, like I think that kind of killed his career and the <laughs> at the same time. The, we need to get uh, a, a Jupiter Ascending 2, but we need to have John Cena in it as yeah. Channing Tatum's brother. Oh, and, we, and we can go down. It's all about family. Like, it's all about the family. Oh, wait, he did do right. a Magic Mike movie, Dennis mm-hmm. reminded me. Yeah, okay. Did all right. <laughs> did that trilogy. The part uh, three, yeah, that failed. Magic <laughs> Mike trilogy. Yeah, the Magic <laughs> Mike trilogy. Real quick, guys, from You Fuck That Beesh for 199. Right. Saw God and X Kong didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I hate it when that happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you got it. You suddenly wanted to start gambling. <laughs> <laughs> Max bet. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, we got one more topic that I really want to touch on today, and that is the topic of Alex Kurtzman and Star Trek Legacy. Uh, I really want to dive into this because I, I, I this article infuriated me. So. Uh, Alex Kurtzman did an interview with Den of Geek lately. I'm going to read you uh, this little section here. And what are the highly requested Star Trek legacy series? Ever since Picard season three reunited the crew of the Enterprise D and ended with the Enterprise G beginning a new voyage under the command of Captain Seven of Nine, fans have clamored for a follow-up show. While Picard season three showrunner Terry Metalis has said several times that he already has plenty of ideas for the spinoff series and even proposed the title Star Trek Legacy in the first place, there's been no official green light from Paramount since Picard ended last year. What is the holdup? And then Kurtzman responds, if I had a magic button, a magic green light button for Star Trek Legacy, and it was all on me, I'd push that button today, Kurtzman tells Mm -hmm. Denim. Right now, it's beyond my pay grade. And can I just say like how disingenuous and stupid that fucking statement is? Yeah, he is, literally, he, he is literally the head of the production company that is in charge of all of Star Trek TV shows. If he wanted to go to Paramount and say, hey, we want to do Star Trek Legacy, they'd be like, okay. So, Brian, I want to get your take on this since you're our, our Star Trek guy on the panel. Yeah, he's an idiot. That's completely untrue. It's disingenuous. It's not, it's not factual. Um, I, we've had multiple talks with people behind the scenes that where he 
in his words, he wants to do these other projects first before even considering Star Trek Legacy. So period the end, he's he's hundred percent just lying there. It's not true. One hundred percent. Yeah, I was Tom. gonna say well, like, well, can Tom, I translate right that real quick? That translation is there can only be five shows at a time, and they're my five shows, not mm -hmm. anybody else's. And that show made me mad because it was better than my show. So I'm going to ignore it. But anyway, yeah. you were going to ask me something else. So. That's, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was just going to ask, like, you know, Paramount is on the chopping block right now. Like, they've been downgraded to junk status in terms of, like, their credit rating. Um, and th there's some talk that either they're going to get bought out or they're going to start selling off assets like Star Trek. Um, do you think that any studio executive at Paramount might be like, hey, maybe we should green light something the fans actually want instead of just letting Kurtzman continue to produce crap that nobody wants to watch. Well, I'm curious if Brian has heard similar things or not, but from the few rumblings I've heard on this thing is that you guys are right. He's bold faced lying. It comes down to yeah. him. And mm -hmm. from what we've heard from day one is that he is cock blocking this like crazy. Cause he was so upset the Picard was the biggest success thus far out of all these new shows. Cause let me rewind it just a little bit. So everybody understands how Picard season three even came to be right. Kurtzman was off doing his stuff. Uh, Kiva Goldsman was the original showrunner on that show. He went and fucked off and did some stuff. Terry Metalis came in in the third season. And then just like every other show they have, they reconfigure everything cause they can't get it right the first time out. And they were just like, yeah, go do whatever you're going to do. And Metallus' whole thing, and I'm sure Brian can fill this in more, was, you know, he wanted to give the fans what they wanted, the original crew, on one more adventure. Right. And so he got a hold of everybody, got them involved, did what he could, from my understanding, to to, to kind of <laughs> reconfigure things to where he could get rid of season one and two for the most part. And the reason he was able to do all this was because Kurtzman was busy fucking around with Claire Reese. And that's not a person, because we don't even know if he's straight. Um, Clarice would be that series uh, that CBS did that was basically another F you to Brian Fuller because they had the rights to to do the Clarice series and, and Fuller had been trying for a while Science to get the rights to Science of the Lambs for, for, yeah. for, for Clarice to show up in Hannibal. Well, that didn't work out because Kurtzman's like had his grandiose idea of bringing Clarice to primetime. And all you got to do is see the Entertainment Weekly review of that show we go, holy crap, did Doomcock write this review? Because the gloves finally came off because as Matt and others will probably tell you, like Kurtzman is one of these people in Hollywood that's seen as a darling. Okay. He comes in and to, and I've been trying to tell people this for a while. Initially when he was brought on a Star Trek, it was, he saw that and everybody else saw that as him slumming it and doing CBS a favor, right? People don't understand that. It wasn't like, you know, he weaseled his way in here on, no, now he's weaseled his way into the point where he technically does own parts of Star Trek, from my understanding, because of Secret Hideout, and that's causing some issues going forward with the deals. So he has to either be bought out or he's going to buy Star Trek wholesale. So that is a whole, a whole other conversation to be had. But I'm curious what Brian has to say on this, because, yeah, that's my understanding is he could green light it at any time. He could have let it go. In fact, people above wanted that show yep. with Terry, and he said no. So, and yeah. that's why there's so much confusion right now, because there was some people, I guess, were trying to go over his head and get a movie made. And I'm curious if Brian knows anything about this. And that's where Picard or, or uh, Picard, Patrick Stewart was saying stuff about a movie, right? Because there yeah. was talk yeah. of that. They were trying to drum up interest. So like Kurtzman wasn't, wasn't interested. So they were trying to get like the ball rolling uh, so that it would bring Kurtzman to the table to even talk about it. it never happened you're 100 right Kurtzman has all the power to make this happen but he wants to make his shows first and the only power he doesn't have is to make unlimited star trek shows you know and um yep. so he already he can't make unlimited and he's already doing his yeah. projects but but, but I'm, I'm sitting there looking at like you know this whole like starfleet academy thing i'm like who's asking for a new uh, a oh starfleet and he academy? forced that through he yeah. forced that through yeah, so he did. 100 so he had an excuse so he couldn't do picard right because that because brian's correct that's what i had heard too is that he had this five show deal that that's all he could have in production at one but, time uh, i want to throw this to to brett uh so brett you, you know uh a big issue with star trek 
is that it has this hardcore fan base that sticks with it through thick and thin, but it's been getting really thin lately. And a lot of people are starting to just become apathetic to it. I know Matt Bader and myself, big Star Trek fans. We don't care. I checked out on discovery season three, uh, uh, season one, after season one of strange new worlds, we were out because season two was just like stupid woke garbage and nothing is exciting about Star Trek anymore, except for Picard season three, but you had two terrible seasons of Picard before that. And then even Picard season three towards the end there got a little bit wonky, at least for me. So do you think that there's anything Paramount could be doing to actually revitalize uh, Star Trek besides giving fans what they're actually asking for? Look, I'm like, I'm, I'm 110% honest, not a Star Trek guy, never have been, never will be, at least I don't think so. But uh, it goes back to what you've been saying, right? Which is that you have to give the the core audience what they want. But I'm kind of more interested in how all of this, because I, I actually, I, I read it wrong. I thought that Paramount had been sold, because wasn't the idea that they could be sold wholesale in stock to Skydance, Right. And how it's not a done deal yet. But OK, so I, I miss I, I was fake news this week. I think I mentioned it in passing where like I thought I read that it that it was it wasn't like a topic <laughs> we covered. But like I mentioned that I thought that it, that that had happened. But how will a sale like that affect the production of stuff like this in, in the future? Like that's what's more interesting to me. You are yeah. fake news. Yeah, I am fake. I am fake news. I thought it was. I read it in passing. I don't even remember what I was uh, drawing a comparison to when we were talking about it. But I just mentioned it, and uh, now I'm gonna have to go back and edit that out or something. <laughs> I'm gonna have to sc- like uh, like scrub through like two hours of yesterday, or show. just will Pop- it into existence, and then yes, you'll have to make it happen. Yeah. I was ahead Pop- of my schedule. Pop culture crisis. Yeah. You are <laughs> fake news. So fake. Uh, uh, Vader, if if Paramount were to go forward with us star trek legacy show do you think that that might bring you back into the fold 100 percent would bring me back into the fold at least just to start with you know if if, if they made the show and it and it's and it, and it was bad then i probably wouldn't i probably wouldn't watch it but i i want it to happen i i would absolutely give it a shot um you know star trek is is in a it's another sad sad thing to me i grew up watching star trek i love star trek um, I, I'm honestly getting tired of watching reruns on Pluto TV or whatever the heck that channel is <laughs> on the streaming. Um, cause I've seen them all a hundred times. I want new stuff, but I refuse to watch just the STD. I just, I just, I just, I can't, I can't watch it. You, you know, I know the news, the new season came out. Thankfully the last season we're ever going to have to put up with came out this week, but, um, I've had no interest and no interest to even turn it on. So I forgot. Yeah. It, it, it's sad. It's a sad state. Um, and I don't necessarily need to have more adventures of the old crew, you know, you know, our next generation crew, but I would like to see some stuff come back and sprinkle in some of our old legacy characters. Give us some DS9 characters. Give us some Voyager characters, you know, like like they've done with with Seven and stuff, you know. It, it's, it is what it is. It, it's it's sad to me that, that, that uh, Kurtzman won't let he won't check his ego enough to the point to where he can allow something that us as fans actually want. And it just, it just seems to be a problem all over Hollywood when it comes to these, these big giant legacy yeah. Ho- properties Hollywood, out there. So Hollywood's definitely in a bubble. They hate money, man. Um, they hate money. That, so they do. But uh, I want to go to Odin to talk a little bit about financial stuff, not necessarily Star Trek. Because I know that, um, so when Paramount got downgraded to junk status, what that basically means is that Paramount doesn't have enough cash flow to cover the debt that they currently have. And so any type of of lending or borrowing on Paramount's part is basically like, like dried up for them. They can't do it. And in response to this, Paramount's been like, okay, we're taking austerity measures. We're doing kind of what Disney's doing, which is scaling back on production of stuff to try to focus more on quality over quantity. But uh, how do you think the junk bond uh, status for Paramount is going to affect not only what they produce, but also like who could potentially take over Star Trek in the future? Uh, I mean, I, I think I mentioned it in the, in the chat. I wish you had skipped me on this one. Cause I just, I, I've, I've watched DS nine and that's, that's the only Trek that I've, that I've ever seen. And as far as the, the financial side is, is concerned, I, I don't follow as much about like credit ratings and, and things like that. 
Um, that's that's a little bit over my my head. But what I do know is that, yeah, they had a very difficult year uh, last year. Uh, you had films like Transformers, Rise of the Beast, lose the money. Tra- uh, you had Dungeons and Dragons, lose the money. Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, of course, uh, yeah. e- even though that one ended <laughs> up, they ended up uh, not losing nearly as much as they could have on, on that. But then again, Part 2 is is still in the in the pipeline. And so that's going to, you know, obviously break up some money, too. I don't know what it means for the current projects or, or future projects. But uh, if I had to make a guess, I would say something has to be done um, with the bottom line, especially since when credit ratings get involved and get affected, I assume that that is going to actually make an impact. Whereas losing hundreds of millions of dollars, like in the case of Disney, as long as everything else seems to be going as according to plan, they can just continue to do that. Uh, so that's my own. Yeah. Opinion. Well, I think the big difference here is that Paramount is an entertainment company, whereas Disney has like parks and like, mm-hmm. you know, other types of stuff going. Well, National for it. Amusement used to, right? Yeah. Like they were part of Six Flags and all that other stuff. See, and that's the thing here is like this Sky, if Skydance actually wins the bid and they actually take over, it's going to be pretty much business as usual because all the crap that got Paramount to this place was shit Skydance produced. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. It, they, they're the heads of the, the Mission Impossible films, which were the only success up until the recent one. They were the ones behind the Transformer movies. They were the ones behind, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that we've seen the last, you know, 20 years out of Paramount. So if they come in and take over, it's really going to be just more of the same. Yeah. It's not going to change all that much, I don't think. Now, if somebody like Warner Brothers, because they've got like two or three more days and then they can actually make another offer is my understanding. Now, if somebody like Warner Brothers or somebody else were to come in and, you know, and play ball, you know, that would be a different scenario. Then maybe there would be some changes because then Paramount would just basically be, you know, soaked up and be part of Warner Brothers then. And it'd be under Zasloff and their purview and whatnot. So, I mean, there could be some major changes then. But that's the thing is the IPs that paramount is sitting on are technically worth more than the than the studio is now right like that's the problem they have so who knows they might have to turn around and just start selling off star trek and ninja turtles and spongebob and all this other stuff just to make it worth any you know worth their while because sherry redstone has a number in her head and it sounds like she's not going any lower than that now they're Skydance all- went from buying it to merging now. So that's where things have changed. Yeah. yeah and, and also there's this issue right now with Nickelodeon where they're getting a lot of bad press over quiet on the set. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot, lot, lot of like. Yeah. Quality. They need a new. Like, funny uh, how image. Warner Brothers are the one that produced that documentary too. So Warner mm-hmm. Brothers could be like, here, let's help ruin one of your brands. And oh, hey, let us well, uh, buy up some of your company. Uh, also, Brett, I don't know if you, if you actually watched the full documentary yet. Um, you know, aside from the stuff with the with the, the bell guy, yep. uh, you have, have to forgive me. I, I I'm not familiar with him, but like, it it, it came off as a very disingenuous hit piece, uh, kind of like woke women who work in in um, journalism, specifically targeting the most powerful guy in children's TV to try, try to take him down. Like it really felt like a Me Too type like hit job. The, uh, I mean, the me. first the first portion of that documentary was a bit about that. It wasn't about assault allegations. It was about the fact that uh, Dan Schneider was just a bad guy to work for. Right. But yeah. I mean, they, I, I will, I will say like that may be true, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of people were revealed to have bad track records. There was multiple pedos that were, <laughs> that were exposed in the making of that process. But anytime another <laughs> studio produces something like this, you know, you have to ask, like, look, it's for profit activism. It's it's right. being made by a company that's being made to be sold. And and it would be kind of interesting what would happen if Warner Brothers is like, oh, hey, we produced this documentary that exposed all this bad stuff that went on with Dan Schneider and with Nickelodeon back in the day. But now we're going to make a bid for part of the company yeah. that, you know, the parent yeah. company for this. Well, I've seen wasn't, the whole- wasn't there talk about, uh, you know, Warner Brothers potentially buying out Paramount? Yeah. They, oh no. And I, I thought that was also that's what I was saying is yeah, that's what that he was were, saying. Yeah. And Warner brothers just entered into that picture deal with Tom Cruise. Who's of course a huge part of Paramount because of Skydance. Yeah, and he moved but, his office over to Warner brothers yeah. as well. Yeah. I do want to give Kurtzman credit for one thing though. He did executive produce one of the most underrated shows of all time, which was the limitless adaptation that was on CBS. 
Everyone should watch that. He basically had nothing to do with that. I know. Uh, I did love that. I did. I love that show. I love it. It it was a great show. Good movie tie-in to Odin. You were going to say something? Yeah, because I've 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 also seen the the full documentary, and it's even my wife who loves documentaries and is more apt to actually like appreciate the whole Me Too stuff because that's just more where she aligns uh, like politically. Um, she even was like, this was just a mess because it just didn't know what it wanted to talk about. And my one of my biggest issues, and it kind of is rel- relative to uh, Paramount, but then also Disney in this as well, is it spends all this time trying to talk about how terrible Dan Snyder is, but then it doesn't actually talk about what he actually did because he didn't actually mm-hmm. do anything other than ask someone to give him a, a massage. Like that's like the worst, again, creepy right that he would do that but still creepy. at the same time it's like Weird. that's the worst thing but it's There's like he's asking adult women in, adult yeah. women to do it right and so like that's like the worst thing that really was was indicated well, but um what, what the thing that about what disney gets involved is that one of the pedos that they talk about in it right who the, and they basically are trying to talk about how dan schneider is like connected with you know you know he was on his set and he was in control etc but then they gloss over oh yeah he did go on after he got released from prison to go work on sweet life of zach and cody a Disney production. Yep. And it's yes. like, oh, okay, yeah, we're just going to gloss over the fact that Disney right. hired a, a a convicted pedophile. Like, just going to let that go. But no, we're going to go after Nickelodeon really, really hard. And again, it was really hard. I think that's a requirement yeah. for Disney. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like it. Well, well, you, you know what's weird. funny, guys, is I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I used to work in Hollywood. Um, and uh, <laughs> like, like when they were talking about the stuff that Dan Schneider was doing, I was, I was like, yeah, that's every producer in Hollywood. Like these guys are all narcissistic egomaniacs. They're all assholes. They're all trying to like screw people over. And that's why they are in the position that they're in. Yeah. Like, like like nothing that Dan Schneider did in that documentary that they presented is, is something that like not every other producer I've ever seen in Hollywood has done. I don't don't, don't care, man. I don't care how hard you ask. I'm never going to give you a massage. (laughs) My issue wasn't that so much as what I, considered like the stuff he was doing with the kids like with the foot fetish stuff and some of the other stuff like clearly like that's the thing to me is like it may not necessarily come off as something illegal or it could be considered something as quote-unquote innocent but when somebody is clearly getting some kind of sexual gratification out of it and their children well i i I don't think that there was sexual gratification because a lot of of children's comedy which is what he specializes in it's about gross stuff it's like feet are gross and so we're gonna make a joke out Mm, of it there's a bit there was a bigger foot finish than tarantino man come on well well, well, look like like, i'm just gonna say that you can read into that as an adult that it's like sexual but like as a kid, as a teen, it's like if you sneeze on someone and snots on their face, that's not that's not a, a money shot. The right? difference like, is though, a, Matt, is kids aren't different. writing this shit though. That's the yeah. problem. But but it's that's it's, where I'm coming from. it's geared towards their head. I'm not trying to this, the, I'm not trying the, to say the, Snyder's guilty or innocent. I'm just saying that there is definitely something there that needed to be addressed. Now I haven't seen the documentary myself. I know like Mark Singer and something like that walked out of it going, This is not what and it probably was a hit piece because that's what they're known for, and we've seen them yeah. time and time again. You're right. Dan has never been convicted of anything, but he also come out and apologized for some of it, took the blame for some of it. He didn't take the blame for the worst of it. But to me, it's like people like this should have been called out sooner, I think, is the bigger point well, of this. The and this thing behavior this shouldn't be is, uh, considered if you okay. Read, if you read the D files on, on Film Threat, it, it, it reads to me very similar to what happened to John Lasseter. Like, like this guy was basically the king of children's content at Nickelodeon. And they had to take him down in order to, you know, replace him with new, more diverse, more DEI friendly people. Like, that's just what it felt like to me. Like the stuff about like, like the pedos who like, you know, actually like did like, you know, sexual assault and stuff like that. That was horrifying. That was terrible. But whenever it came back to Dan Schneider, it was just like, he's just a regular Hollywood producer who's an asshole. And that's what they're, they're, you know. And and it's not that he. Allegedly impregnated. Britney Spears and, sister, but, and that's just well they didn't even go into that like that's they didn't the thing. even like, get to that huh? well, well okay. they probably didn't just because even what they were presenting was was again you would have to read into it as, as Matt was saying right and I think that we can definitely look at that as adults now post 90s because also very different time too with what was seen as being acceptable to me like I honestly wish the whole thing had been focused more on child acting because that is where the story is 
that that's where you can start to actually expand out to go after not just Nickelodeon, but also Disney, because there's a lot of like there are some things in there where you're like, OK, yeah, Dan's not a good guy. Like we can know at least that much, right, that he was not a saint and he did a lot of bad things, really creepy things like too. But as far as like doing something that. Uh, by the fact that they were trying to connect him directly to actual pedophiles like that was their intention was to show this connection but then they couldn't actually prove anything and it was just like oh look at all this weird stuff he's doing and it's like yeah but then you're just again it was very yeah. falsely presented i think and yeah, it, it was, was nice being monetized before uh talking about quite on the set so that was a nice thing oh i'm uh, sorry uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay real quick uh we got a couple of super chats we need to get to uh so from uh, Shane H. Wilder for four ninety nine, Brett is fake <laughs> news. Say it ain't so. Enjoy going back and listening to yourself at two times to try no. to find it. <laughs> laughing my fucking ass off. I will never listen. I I, I have a, a real complex. I don't listen back to anything that I do uh, ever. Like what, when we're putting the <laughs> like, when we do the chapters at the end, I'm like I cover my ears. I can't do it. And uh, the idea of myself at two times speed is one of the most horrific things I can possibly imagine. <laughs> you and I are the same. You and yeah. I are the same. I, I I can't I can't stand to go back and watch our old shows. It drives me crazy. Yeah. Oh. And uh, you, you fucked that beach for one nine nine. This do you feel lightheaded after STD season five, episode one? I haven't seen I haven't it. Watched it. I haven't watched it. I think Brian's the only one who watched it and he had to go take a shit. So and he watched I'll it. Tell you, he I'll watched tell you everything though. you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. Internet guy for $2. Hey, here's $2. Thank you. Internet Thank guy. You. We really appreciate it. And of course we got the uh, Kelchi Oki. Probably butchered that one. For five dollars, can someone explain the stock? Warner's has lower stock than Paramount, but Paramount is about to go under. Warner is bigger than Paramount. Am I right? So when it comes to the Warner's Paramount thing, um, Warner's is owned by AT and T, so they can cover any debts that uh, Warner's might have. Paramount apparently can't cover their current debt, which is why they've been downgraded. Um, and also, I think National Amusements or uh, the Paramount Group, or whatever they're fucking calling themselves now, uh, just in general, uh, Sumner Redstone screwed up that stock by splitting the company. And uh, then, like, they had to remerge the company. And ever since then, the, the stock has been, like, you know, struggling to, to go up because, like, they're not doing anything new. And, they're, and COVID really messed them up in terms of, like, the value of what they were putting out and stuff like that. So Paramount's in a much... Uh, harder position than Warner Brothers is, at least in my opinion. Uh, Tom Odin, do you guys have any insight into that? I'm not a financial analyst, so I can't get into the whole ins and outs. But yeah, from my understanding, it has more to do with what you just said, basically, unless Mike's in the chat and he can pipe yeah. up and say something. Otherwise, yeah. All right, guys. Well, we had a lot to talk about today and we talked about it. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this episode of Salty Saturday. Uh, Odin of Easter. Lord of the, the Pineapple Pizza. What do you got going on? And do you have any final thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, you can find me at OMB Reviews on YouTube, Odyssey, Rumble, also over on Twitter as well. And I do a show every Tuesday evening, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, and talking about box office, uh, movie news, things like that. And it's it's always a lot of, oh, gosh, I hate you so much. Um, I have an answer for pineapple on pizza. It's pizza. <laughs> And uh, you can find me there, and uh, I, I'll have box office breakdown tomorrow. Also, I write for geeksandgamers.com, and you can find my box office breakdowns over there every Sunday slash Monday morning. And as far as final thoughts, hey, it's Easter Saturday, everybody. It's It's been almost a full week since Easter, and I hope everyone had a wonderful, blessed Easter. And remember, Easter is more than just a day. It's an entire season, so happy and blessed Easter, everybody. Yeah, I just want to remind everyone that Odin got me a gig writing at geeksandgamers.com as well, so I have some articles up on there. Uh, Tom Connors, any final thoughts? And where can people find more of you? I like turtles. Um, hi, there's my cat. Uh, okay. You can find me at Midnight's Edge, Midnight's Edge After Dark. Uh, I do a thing called Mead Radio from time to time. I think I'm supposed to do uh, Tom and Geary today, so uh, mm -hmm. I'll be on there in about an hour. But uh, Thanks for having me. It's always fun what, to hang on. What are you guys watching today? Uh, I think we're talking about Enemy Mine with uh, Lewis oh. Gossett Jr. and Dennis Quaid. Nice tribute. That's good. All right. And we want to thank Brett for being on our show today. Thanks for slumming it with us for about two hours. Uh, you got any final thoughts and where can people find more of you? 
Uh, guys, just uh, thanks for having me on. That's my, my final thought is thanks for having me on. And if you guys want to follow me, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twix at Brett Dasovic on both of those. And just Pop Culture Crisis is five days a week. It's Monday through Friday. It's at 3 p.m. Eastern right on YouTube. So go ahead and check us out there. I think you guys will have a lot of fun watching. Excellent. And is Brian back? If he's not back, <laughs> he's, he's uh, not. I got to take a yeah. dump. Yeah, yeah, he, he, <laughs> five minutes like, left. He's got it. Yeah. This, this stream makes me want to shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you can check out Brian at Pop Culture Unleashed. Uh, the link is in the, the description. Uh, he hasn't been doing any live streams lately, but that's not his fault. <laughs> his brother Shane has been sick and taking a break. But uh, go and support Brian when you can. He, he's good people. Uh, except if you're Fluffy Panda, then the Fluffy Panda is like, fuck Brian. Uh, <laughs> Matt Vader 74, any final Yo. thoughts? And what do we got going on this week? Um, boy. <laughs> First off, I want to thank everybody for being here. Brett's always awesome to have you on the show. Tom, Odin, you guys, of course. I, I love having you guys on. Um, Brian, uh, Brian's not here. He's He must have been prairie dogging pretty hard to be able to leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was you know, like a turtle who was poking out. Yeah, like the turtle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I don't know what we got going on this week. I think we're going to go watch Monkey Man or whatever the hell that movie's called this weekend. And uh, we got everybody Trans coming. allegory? I, I don't know. Whatever. It's a, a movie. We're going to go watch a movie and talk about it on Tuesday. But we got everybody coming to town for the meetups this week. So I'm not sure what exactly the schedule is coming up. So, But I'm going to find out in a text here, I'm sure, in about five minutes. Um, uh, and other, in other news, um, me and uh, Salty Alex, we're, we've been pushing our new uh, Salty Nerd Gaming channel. Um, if you guys are into video games and hell divers and that kind of stuff, just type in salty nerd gaming. It's just like this label, except it's got a blue outline. Go over there and hit hit the sub button and we play games usually late night over there. So um that's what I got yeah. going on, Matt. What do we got going on? What are you doing? Well, real quick, I want to hit up William Forbes, one of the Saturday superstars for two dollars. Later Gators, fun live stream, great weekend, y'all. Yeah, man. And we're going to be seeing William next yes. week at the Nerd Rotic Meetup. So, guys, yeah. next week here in Las Vegas. Oh, Brian's back. How was Brian's your shit, done, Brian? I was done crashing. It was fantastic. Do you feel relieved? <laughs> yeah. Bro, I barely made it there, bro. I, I jumped on it. I, I, I hit the bidet immediately the second I sat down. And I just screamed, like, oh! My wife woke up and was like, what's wrong? Everything good? I'm like, I'm fine. Just go back to sleep. <laughs> Like that you scene from Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. Oh, bro. Whew. Yeah, I have a bidet. It's fantastic. <laughs> Once you get Japanese one, it'll Once change you your get life. One, you can't. You can't go back. I'm telling you. Yeah, you, you can't go back. You can't go back. And pooping Bougie in public is no longer an option. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, well, guys. So next week here in Vegas, we are hosting the uh, Nerd Rotic Meetup. So a bunch of YouTubers are going to be out here. They're going to be using our studio next Tuesday. We're going to have Blaine from Criticus, Criticless, the owner of the Criticless app, in the studio with us for our live stream. We're going to be talking about Monkey Man and probably a bunch of other stuff. But we're also going to be having a lot of YouTubers into the Salty Nerd Studios here in Las Vegas doing their live streams. Uh, we're going to be hosting Friday Night Tights, a bunch of other fun stuff. But, so uh, if you can... Side scrollers. You, Side scrollers, yep. Uh, we're going to have uh, a lot of people coming into the studio. So if you're going to be in town, uh, be sure to watch us and uh, let everyone know that, uh, you know, uh, Salty Nerd Studios is open for business. But uh, other than that, I just want to say thank you to everyone who gave us Super Chats today. That's Scotty Dub, Salty Saturday Superstar, for $100. Thank you so much for that, Scotty Dub. Oh, yeah. Mexican Iron Man, Shane H. Wilder, R to the Icky, Wendy Hunter, Magna Defender 98, thank you for doing your first super chat with us. Uh, we also got Fluffy Panda, You Fucked at Beach, Internet Guy, Kelchi Oki, William Forbes, and what a way to end the live stream with one more gifted Salty Nerd membership from Samuel Schwager. Thank you so much, Sam you. Samuel. That is awesome. Guys, uh, I want to thank my fantastic panel of nerds for being here. Uh, you guys are awesome. And as always, everyone, uh, uh, if you like this show, recommend it to your friends. Go check out our movie commentaries at our Patreon at saltynerdclub.com. And as always, stay salty, my friends. Hey, folks, thanks so much for watching this live stream. If you want to watch our previous live stream, make sure to click right here. Or if you would like to check out one of our favorite highlights, click right here.